But the question really is, what were they allowing to go on? What were they a part of? What was the social process that was underway? I, you know, sometimes you can kind of be a little bit flippant with people and they say, you know, well, you saw these people marching down the street and in lockstep. Didn't you get it? And, you know, of course they should have gotten it. But a lot of times from the inside, these things are not so easy to see. That people don't really understand what's going on. Why? Well, because to a certain extent, people accept the parameters of the system as it is. Of the social processes, of the conception of human beings, as they're, they're accepted, as they are in society. Now, the, the truth of the matter is that what is the conception, uh, what's the idea, what's the sense of, you, of a human being behind MySpace or Facebook or the whole, you know, or ask yourself, what's the connection between this and globalization? Or let me give you another example. As uh, LaRouche in a recent paper, which I think a lot of people have seen will be in EIR, it's, it's actually on the website, uh, I think it's entitled Extreme Events. And, uh, Lynn goes through the connection between Henry Paulson, who's the Secretary of the Treasury, former head of Goldman Sachs, the great financial, one of the great financial wizards of the moment. And the fact that the entire financial system today is based on the same kind of unregulated electronic exchange of so-called financial values. And the idea is that in this world of electronic exchange, information exchange, nothing can be regulated, and this is the real world. This virtual world is what runs and allocates activity for human beings. In other words, you can think at one level, just to be, a, you can think of my, uh, the, the world financial system as a somewhat gigantic MySpace. <laughs> it's an insane internet world where the idea is you are on this network and you're trying to make some kind of social connection or a financial connection with somebody on the network who might be supposedly interested in the same things. But of course, they may not be who they present themselves to be. <laughs> For example, we just had a case, just to give you how concrete this is, and I'll just tell you a couple things to get the, the political idea behind this. There have been two cases, actually, in Ohio, in, in and around Cleveland, where uh, in one case, it was the end of October, uh, I think it was October 30th or 31st, a judge by the name of Boyko, B-O-Y-K-O, I forget exactly which court this was, but it was, a, it was a state court, ruled Deutsche Bank, which of course is one of the big banks in the world, uh, interestingly enough, tries to present itself as having a somewhat conservative profile. But Deutsche Bank was suing as the representative of a bunch of investors uh, to foreclose on, I think it was 14 different properties, 14 homes. Now, the whole foreclosure question I'll come back to, but the United States is undergoing right now a rate of foreclosures, that is people losing their homes, families, that is, uh, that is beginning to approximate, even if you account for certain proportions of home ownership and population, that by the, I would say, certainly by the, uh, the spring of next year, at present rates, and it could accelerate, would be the same as the Depression of 1932-33. The legendary Depression, which most people have now forgotten about. In fact, it would be an interesting test to take some of the youth and find out how many of them have any idea of when the Depression was, what it was like, because I think one of the things that's happened to the younger generation is no connection to history whatsoever. And this is part of the MySpace world. This is a part of the Internet world. You, the, what's, what's reality? Get on the Internet, make a connection to somebody, and that's reality. What, who, where did that person come from? They can make it up. 
Not that somebody can't con you in person, but it's all that much easier to con you over the internet. People construct an entire identity, and you have no way of testing it out. So what happened in this case? The judge, there was really two things that came up. Number one, the judge ruled that indeed Deutsche Bank could not foreclose on these homes right away because they had no proof of ownership. They couldn't prove that the people that they represented actually owned those properties, held the mortgages. Now, there are two reasons for this. One is sort of the more linear one, but the, the other is more shocking in its own way. Number one, the idea, what, what's happened now is it used to be, believe it or not, that you couldn't resell a mortgage. A mortgage is when you, the, the, you loan money to somebody to buy a house. And there are all kinds of rules that govern mortgages. These are huge investments and so on and so forth. Now, in general, one of, the, it, one of the problems is there are a lot of what's called regulation, which of course you've been taught in economics is bad because it, 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 stults, it, it stunts the individual uh, right to do whatever he wants. That's called liberty. Freedom. Do whatever you want. Screw whoever you feel like screwing. Just, you know, don't let anybody get in your way. Okay? So... It, now, regulation is when you say, well, you can't do anything. So it's it told, the, the, it used to be the case you couldn't sell a mortgage. If you had the mortgage, you know, there was somebody, you effectively had an IOU for the house. You couldn't sell that to somebody else. Basically, you were invested in the mortgage, and the whole idea was you waited for the payment. And you, you know, if the payment didn't come, you had the house that you could get as collateral. In the broadest sense, that was the essence of the regulation. Now, that no longer really exists. It does exist somewhat for chartered banks. But since the situation has been so deregulated on the financial markets and uh, non-bank lenders have uh, come in, it's no longer the case. So, for example, and this, people have to understand how weird this stuff is because there is a certain reaction which is, oh my God, how could they do that? Uh, I don't know how they could do it. They do it. Okay? Yeah, some things are just a fact. Okay? Now, so one of the things they do is they, re they bundle mortgages, like a, a, a bank that might have a bunch of mortgages or somebody else, they take them and they call bundling them. They take a whole bunch of them. And they sell what's called a security based on those mortgages. The mortgages are collateral against the security. Now, actually, at a certain point, some of these securities aren't really even connected to the mortgage directly. You're just betting on the price of those mortgages, literally. That's what some of these derivative indexes are. You bet on the price. You don't have the mortgages as security. Now, there are other things like called collateralized debt obligations. And here what they do is they take the mortgages and they divide them up into slices. This is what they call them, tranches, slices. So you get some of the mortgages that are AAA rated and you get some of those mortgages. Or you get a, a, a security based on the reliability of those mortgages. In some cases, the mortgages are collateral. Now, you begin to realize why it is if you can sell and resell these things, why it might be very hard to figure out who has the mortgage. Who really is the person who has the mortgage on this home? Now, it gets even worse. And this is what got interesting in this particular case. Okay? Because it turns out that while you're supposed to have proof of a mortgage, you own the mortgage, you're the lender. Because these sales are going on so wildfire, in the years when there was regulation, judges would often simply take the lender's word for it. And they say, okay, you own the mortgage, okay. Because the idea was you assumed that they had proof and there was, there was no resale. Now the judge said, well, wait a minute. I don't know who's got this mortgage. But the practice of, trans of, of selling securities based on mortgages had gotten so, has gotten so peculiar and strange that indeed 
many of these banks that were the trustees that were involved in the transactions were no longer registering who owned the mortgages. You know why? Because it took time. It got in the way of the electronic transfer. <laughs> That's true. In other words, instead of saying, now I can't process this until we take the, the, you know, the title or the, the deed and run it through a process and make sure you're the one who owns it, and therefore you can sell it to somebody else, I'm just going to transfer it. It's a security, it's so on and so forth. So we just do an electronic transfer. And in the course of doing this, they never asked for proof of ownership, for proof of the mortgage. One estimate is that 40% of the transactions related to mortgages are no longer registered at all. There's no proof of ownership. So there, to the other, in the last couple of days, there was a second case yeah, of a, 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 a Ohio, Ohio judge ruling that a bank could not foreclose because they had no proof of ownership. Not actually a, a bad, interesting little step, but I'll tell you some more in, in this vein. Okay? So we have a completely insane, unregulated world of electronic transfers. And this is supposed to be the new financial... Uh, this, is, this basically is the basis for the bubble. This is the financial system, not mortgages. That's just... It's, see, the mortgage problem is not causing the problem in the financial system. The financial system caused the mortgage problem. It, and now the crisis in it is showing up in particular. But what is the problem? The problem is there's virtually no financial instrument in the system that isn't ultimately tied to some aspect of, aspect of this bubble. After the uh, internet bubble blew out in the early 2000s, Bernan uh, uh, Greenspan and then Bernanke promoted the, the housing bubble as the way to roll over all the financial instruments in the system. Now, there are other elements to this, but this was a big part of it. And indeed, why? Because you could grab an actual income stream. People do pay their mortgages. And this covered a huge portion of the population. And it's going to show up more. We've just seen the beginning of this. And remember, what the mortgage, this question of mortgages is not, is not a technical matter. This is how people live. First of all, they live in houses. 60 to 70 percent of the families in the United States live in privately owned homes or privately mortgaged homes. People live, this is, this is the nest egg for most people. If there's any buffer that people have against health problems or pensions that are too small, their wealth is in their home. So what you're dealing with is something that goes right to the core of the lives of 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of the population. And it's not just the ones who get foreclosed on. Somebody will say, well, I, I don't get it. But that, it doesn't work that way. How does this really work? All you need to do is take a neighborhood and have one or two foreclosures out of 50 homes. The value of every house in that neighborhood goes down. For two reasons. One is, there's a concern that this neighborhood if people in the neighborhood aren't making enough money. Can't meet their payments. But there's another reason. In general, you, when you get empty homes, they become areas of crime. Drug transactions, squatters. The house is not kept up. And increasingly, when you have mortgage holders who might be 5,000 miles away, as compared to a system where, in general, mortgage holders were in the community, savings and loans, smaller community banks. These things are not kept up. So people, and this of course causes a lot of anger. People look out in the neighborhood, they've kept it nice, they've paid, made their payments, but despite all that, that value of their house is going down. Their family's in worse shape. Their pension retirement fund is being undermined because they thought of the mortgage as being part of that, selling the house as being part of that. And, indeed, the security of their own families and their own persons may be at stake. 
This is the way people live. So we're getting much closer to the bone. Now one of the things that happened in this, in this Ohio case is that the judge commented, actually it wasn't a judge, it was, uh, uh, it was in, in one of the financial sections, commented that one of the concerns was that maybe some of these mortgages were sold more than one time. Since there's no record, since it's all electronic transfers, how do you check that the same house wasn't sold to two or three different people? Or at least a security based on the house. Now, if that's in the financial system, and it probably is, frankly, but even if the doubt comes up, if people begin to wonder, oh my God, if I can't go to a court and foreclose because indeed my, what I believe is a security based on this house has been sold to two or three different people besides myself, I better, then everything is a mess. And that's the nature of the present financial system. Look, you know, this system is based on the same kind of insane reality or unreality as your social life on, on MySpace. It's got about the same connection. You know, on MySpace, people make up personalities. That's well known. They make up histories. They live out their fantasy. And the idea is you're completely hidden by the computer screen. Yeah, think about it. In personal contact, and there is something to it, it doesn't mean you can't be fooled. But when you see somebody in person, there are other clues as to what's going on in their mind. You're dealing with a real person. Sometimes the way they look at you, the way they inflect. Yeah? Earlier when you were talking about, um, because I, I know you said you can't tell who had like, houses before you got it, like mm -hmm. two or three people had it before you. Not before, even right now being sold, a security based on the house sold to two or three different people. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm telling you, they've done it. <laughs> and, and part of it is it's all done by elect, unregulated electronic transfer. So what are they all trying to move in on the same day? No, it's more a question of foreclosures. I'm not talking about moving two or three families in at the same time. But a family owns a house, and then somebody makes an investment based on, and says, I'm gonna, I believe that that mortgage is going to go up in value. So I'm going to buy part of that mortgage, or I'm, the, the bank is going to sell me a financial instrument based on that mortgage. Now the problem comes up is if the bank has sold this kind of, have, have sold instruments based on this mortgage to two or three different investors, then if you, they can make a decision on whether to try to foreclose on you. So while one guy might not foreclose, the other guy might try to foreclose. Then they have to fight over what they're foreclosing on, plus it, put, it, it might foreclose on somebody that doesn't have to be foreclosed. So that's the threat. It's not so much, although I wouldn't rule out even going to the extreme that you're talking about. Okay? <laughs> All right? I would rule it out, but that, that's not the kind of case we're dealing with. Yeah. The reason I ask is I was trying to understand what you were saying because I was going to say that if they were something like, if they, I, I thought you meant like the person who was buying, who currently owned it, like cutting track, who had it before them. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought you were talking about. Yeah. I was going to say, like, tag the house, and, like how more weird it's got a vet number. Right. Like, assign the number to the house, like with the deed or whatever. So right. Like, you type that number in or whatever you can see the history. Yeah. In general, but you see, what we're saying is that that kind of regulation is no longer exists. In other words, people are, are buying and selling financial instruments that are based on the mortgages, and they're not registering it with anybody. So you only find this out in court, so to speak. Now, I think it's very interesting. A couple of things, uh, uh, had, uh, one thing that happened just today and there's a couple of interesting things that happened today. But one of them, and this is, you know, this is why we're running this campaign. You know, I come from a different generation, so um, in some sense, this is not unlike what we did 
in, uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, when you had, of course, the infamous uh, 1968 boomer, baby boomer, you know, counterculture. And, you know, uh, we ran, we mean the, 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 La, the LaRouche movement of its day, uh, ran a campaign exposing the fallacious roots of the counterculture. And I'll say something, even though the counterculture of the 1960s and 70s is in many ways the basis for what we see today, the disassociation, the cynicism, <coughs> in many ways, however, the present form of the counterculture, or the, the culture, I wouldn't call it the counterculture, and that's part of the point, okay? The, this internet social world, of, and I mean, what's, what's key to it is it is disassociated. By that I mean literally, the idea is it's not connected to reality. My reality is my space. You know, it, it, for the, um, the boomer generation, the slogan was, get out of my space. <laughs> I do my thing. <laughs> for this generation, it's my space. I make it up. <laughs> I do whatever I want. And that's what we're dealing with. It's disassociated. In a, in a clinical psychological sense, p someone's living in a fantasy world, a self-constructed world, with the idea that it doesn't have to have anything to do with reality. And of course, there are other elements to this. It's, you know, what everybody's looking for is uh, you know to hook up with somebody. And of course, the idea is to hook up with somebody you never knew. To hook up with somebody is sort of the perfect match in my space. Is they don't know you and you don't know them and it's a one night stand. It's a party. You're not interested in the person. You're only interested in the made up person. In the phony image. Or whatever you can get across. And does it work? Now I'll tell you a little secret in this kind of thing. When you reach a point in, in, when people are living in this kind of virtual world, think about a fantasy something simpler, something a little more real in its own way. The typical fantasy that somebody has. They're sitting there and they're fantasizing their brains out. You know, and usually they're fantasizing other fluids out, but you know. <laughs> you know, and you know, they're sitting there and they're going, oh, you know, you know I, I know that this time I'm going to really score and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Wake up. Get out of the fantasy. Usually, what's the first reaction? Minimally. I'm not in a fantasy. Yeah. Irritated. Yeah. Right? Get out. Get, leave me alone. Come on. Don't break this up now. I'm getting to the good part. <laughs> now, think about what happens to this MySpace world. From two standpoints, if you try to interrupt somebody in MySpace, or Facebook, or whatever, or in a game, and probably the most dangerous form of this is the gamers. They, they are angry. They're annoyed. Leave me alone. Don't interfere. I, I'm, I'm developing a social network here. I might get somewhere. Leave me alone. Now what happens in the worst scenario when they're not just being interrupted by a friend who says, get out of this? What happens when the world tries to intrude on them? What happens when somebody who's sitting there, uh, their, their parents are foreclosed on? They can't, they can't deal with, they can't live out their fantasy anymore. The world won't conform to what they want. But these are people who are not clear on the difference between reality and the virtual world. You have a dangerous mix. See. You can't have a world. Let me give you an example of this problem with the internet and the computer world or the gamer world. What happens when somebody, when you deal with, what do I mean by dealing with reality? When you try to deal with reality, you learn that there are certain constraints. It's part of growing up. Not everything having to do with growing up is bad. Children, in the beginning, don't really distinguish too much between what they want and what they can do. You know, if they, like, you know, a good example is watch a kid with a pet. 
Now, sometimes they love the pet and so on and so forth. But also, the pet to the child is an object. And so, you know, they pull the ear, particularly if it's a puppy and it's not too dangerous, or a kitten, you know. And they'll, they play with it like it's a thing. And it takes them a while to figure out that it's not a thing, it's a living object, and it, you know, it, it might feel pain, and you shouldn't treat it that way. By the same token, the child has to learn all kinds of things about the way the real physical world works. Like, you know, the classic case that, you know, he has to learn that electric switches might be dangerous. You can't do anything that you want to do. <laughs> sticking, your sister's, to sticking your sister's head in the toilet bowl is not a good thing to do. Okay? You got to learn those things. Now, that's a good process. You're dealing with the real world, and the child begins to learn that other human beings are not objects. You know, in the beginning, mother does whatever you want her to do. The child cries, the child gets what the child wants. The child thinks in terms of, it, it, to the extent that it's not a conscious process, but the child is essentially controlling adults in its environment. And the adults give it power over the world. I want to eat. And, of course, the adults have to interpret things, crying, you know, so on and so forth. So, for a certain period of time, the child gets almost whatever the child wants. It's interesting, the only limit to the child's powers is the limits of the powers of the parents. What, 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 you know, what's the living standard of the population? What's the living standard of the parents? What access does it have? Also, the child learns a lot about society by the control over objects that the parents have. It also begins to learn its own control, but it also learns the limits of its control. It also learns that at some point the parents are going to say no. Not necessarily a horrible thing. Now, it's true that the parents have to do this in the right way. Because this is a great deal of the way the child is socialized and, and gets access to knowledge. All knowledge is social in that sense. In particular, the issue of creative powers and development is if for the child all occurs through its social relations and how its social relations bring it into contact with objects and so on and so forth. There's no unmediated relationship to the sensory world. So it, just on that basis alone, empiricism is shot. Empiricism doesn't work. There is no point in the, in the memory of a, a, a child, adolescent, adult where it's operating from the standpoint of simple sensory input. Its entire sensory organization is organized by its social relationship and its assimilation of certain kinds of concepts, certain ideas, that shape the way in which things are perceived. And this also goes to why this internet stuff is so nuts. Well, I'll come back to a little bit of the technical features of it. But Now, what happens in the Internet world? You know, I, the classic case to me is the gamer, the god mode. You know, most of these games have a god mode where you can do anything. You're god. Okay? You, you just got shot by your opposition? No problem, because... You're impervious. Mm. The mindset of these guys, or like this one guy who described this, the mindset of these guys is they could reshape anything. All you need to do is you know, know the software. It's an unreal world. It's a world where, where if you're manic enough, you can probably rearrange things the way you want it. Or, alternately, what happens to these guys? If they can't rearrange it, what's their emotional state? Rage. Rage. You ever see chess players? Mm. Chess players are funny. I used to see some of these guys. Now, not all of them are like this, but there's a lot of them that you can see the violence in the way they take a piece on the chessboard. <laughs> okay. 
some of them have a style, but some of them it's like. Right. You grab it, you know. It's like, mm, got it. Some of them like to be like like they, they like to have a little, you know, you know. They all get a little sick. They take it in a certain way. But the whole idea is, I got you. And of course, there's nothing more wilder than watching one of these guys when they think they've got something. And they don't. You know, check, check, checkmate. Whoops. It's not checkmate. A lot of angry guys that way. <laughs> but look at this internet world. The internet world is an insane place. Now, to, get, to give you an idea of the problem we face, I, I gave you a sense of this mortgage crisis, just to give you a flavor of it. The entire financial system is gone. It's completely shot. Some people are estimating $400 billion in losses in mortgages. One estimate that's being made now is $4 trillion, or 10 times that amount, because of the leverage and the number of instruments that the mortgages are involved in. And I'll tell you what the really shocking feature of this is. Nobody knows. It's totally deregulated. Nobody has any idea what's out there. Now, this, the financial crash, which is really on now. You know, it's a little, too many people want to know, well, when is the crash going to happen? First of all, this is somewhat, again, this uh, formal idea. Predict for me when the stock market is going to drop, I don't know, 5,000 points. Well, what if I told you the stock market might go up 5,000 points while the system is crashing? <laughs> because, look, people are so desperate to look for speculative gains, and since there's been no regulation and no contraction, there's trillions of uh, dollars worth of instruments out there. In a manic mode, these guys can invest everything under the sun if they think, you know, Bernanke got up tomorrow, or not tomorrow, Monday, and said, you know, we're going to drop interest rates by 2%. Everybody might go into a speculative investment mode and the market might go up 5,000 points. I'm, just, I'm exaggerating for effect, but you get the idea. You know, now, what would really be going on? This is a sign of the system collapsing. Right, the, the, the financial system is so fragile, Bernanke thinks he has to pour hundreds of billions more into the system while it's already at a point of hyperinflationary takeoff. What happens? The system is gone at this point. It's a purely speculative system. And mostly it's a fraudulent system. Now what we do see in reality is in the midst of all this, which is not atypical, you're seeing people foreclosed, jobs cut, automobile jobs are gone. That's another story. The Democratic Party failed to act to save the auto sector when LaRouche called for this two years ago, two and a half years ago. Now what do you see? Ford and Chrysler just signed contracts and laid off 20% of their workforce. We no longer have an auto industry. We have a rising rate, just to give you an idea of this, in 1933, at the relevant, relative height of the Depression, the foreclosure rate, that is people being kicked out of their houses, houses being taken over, was about 1,000 a day. In fact, when, when Roosevelt signed the Homeowners and Loan, Homeowner, Homeowner Lending Act, uh, which was a little bit after the, the suspension and the foreclosures. Um, so this is like May or April, late April or May of 1933, something in there. The foreclosure rate was a thousand a day. That's 365,000 a year if you assume every day. Now, I'll give you an idea. In the last year in the United States, I mean, I think this year alone, we have about a half a million foreclosures. Now, of course. The population is 
two and a half si times the size of what it was in 1933. Approximately 120 million then, approximately 300 million now. And the rate of home ownership was lower. So you can probably make a guess that there were about 30 million homes owned pri by, by individual families, something in that order of magnitude, 20, 30 million. Okay, which means now today you can assume we have about uh, probably on the order of magnitude of 60 or 70 million people who own homes. The home ownership rate is higher. So you're, you have about a six, uh, uh, about a four to one ratio, say, for example. These are rough estimates. Now, however, so that would mean if you have 360,000 foreclosures in 1933, maybe one and a half million would be a similar rate of foreclosure. And I told you we're at about a half a million. However, it's presently pro projected by standard official groups, not us, not wild radical people, typical <laughs> tracking agencies, that pro as many as two million foreclosures could occur in the next 15 months or less. Now, that's a depression level rate. And we're already a third to a half of the way there right now, right this minute. Now, here's where, in a sense, the MySpace and this crisis come together. LaRouche proposed in the middle of August the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act. And he said, we've got to put up a firewall, not just to keep people in their homes, though that's critical. Not just to save the banks. Now, there's where you get into a funny area, because people like to be anti-banker. But you need banks to run a modern economic system. You need local, state banks, federally chartered banks. So LaRouche put that forward in, in the middle of August. And frankly, people knew that this is what needed to be done, people in the financial world. And Congress did nothing. But we went out and organized for this. We went out at the local level. Some of you have been involved in it, state, city, whatever. Now, what, what did we get in general from the youth in the country? In general, I wouldn't say they're for or against. I'd say they don't know. Unless they're personally involved, they don't know. They have no idea of this. Financial blowout, you know, whatever. Um, war in Iran, you know, it, it's, it's not on my computer. It's not that it doesn't compute, it's not on my computer. Because that's all that computes. Oh, you know, impeach Dick Cheney? Never heard of it. <laughs> In other words, what did you get? And this isn't the same as uh, even five or six years ago. What you got, what you get is a total disconnect from reality. I don't know about that. It's not in my space. It's not in my world. I don't have to consider it. I live in this fantasy world. And not only that, I can tell you that my, that my entire peer group my entire age group is increasingly in this work. They may not be on my network, but everybody's in it. it. It becomes an implicit social peer group. That's why people you run into, they say, well, I don't know, yeah, but I, you know, but I have a MySpace account. Well, why? Well, everybody does. In order to be anybody, I gotta get on, I gotta get on somebody's network. And this is the world. I don't need anything else. I don't need a reality. I don't need a home to bring my friends to. So I don't care about foreclosures. All I need is, uh, you know, a cafe. G give me an internet cafe, a Wi-Fi, something. And I, then I can have my, I can have all of the social reinforcement I need. So nothing political. And at, ironically enough, reality does intervene. If we let this go on, when the crisis affects them personally, you'll have a, 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 a mob of enraged people, but more than that, 
they will also have been, be coming out of a completely disassociated state where they have no idea of what the human mind is. None. The human mind for them is a dead digital world. And everybody knows this. You know, one, one good example of it is is emails. When you know, you ever notice that people can really be nasty in an email when you meet them in person, you're shocked because they're not really that nasty. But if they send you an email, it can be like, "Hey, dude." Okay, what up? You too? Screw you. Okay, that's an email message. <laughs> And then you meet the person, you find out they're not like that. But on the uh, over the internet, that's how you act. You express your rage. Also, by the way, the, re the, the reason people do this, keep in mind, see everybody thinks it's clever. Why do people use all these shortcuts? Why do you, why do you say R-U, and instead of spell, spelling out R-U, you, you put the letters R-U? <laughs> why? It saves space. It saves room in the digital world. That's all you need. You don't need inflection. You don't need to express mood. You don't need pitch. It's all reduced to a symbol. So it's, it's, it conforms to the nature of the digital world. Shortcuts take out everything supposedly unnecessary. You take out the human voice, you take out the human mind, you take out everything, and you're reduced to what can be expressed in a digital system. So it's worse than, than just being in a fantasy world. It's also a fantasy world that's constructed out of something that rules out the creative human mind. Just like most of the fantasy world, yeah, this idea of entertainment where, you know, the, where everything is special effects computer-generated special effects. What is this? Not only is it a fantasy world, but it's something that can be gen that's generated in the unreal world of digital effects, which, in a, which cannot express anything human. And so if you limit yourself to that world, you limit yourself to things that are not human. You will not recognize effectively Humanity, something that's distinctly human. You treat things like they're pop-ups on a video screen. Now, we saw this in, in, in one of these cases, I think in, in this case of this shooter in um, Erfurt in Germany. I think this was the case. I thought it was Columbine, but somebody told me. Uh, it, it, but this, this type of experience happened. One of these guys is on a, in a complete shooting phase. And what you get from these guys is they don't remember what they did. They could have been in a computer game. And one of them, uh, what happened, I think, is um, uh, one of the teachers came up. And it was a teacher that he may have had some uh, liking for. And shouted his name. Robert, I think it was. And he shouts his name. And the guy snaps for a second and realizes this is a real person. Change your personal options. Press 4. Okay? <laughs> and he doesn't shoot. Because momentarily, he's snapped out of the state. And this is the kind of thing we're dealing with. Now, what's that? our problem is to take this onto the campuses, into the youth, and recruit them to reality. Now, some of this is political, political reality. Some of it is something else, and some of what you'll see uh, as it's developed uh, today and tomorrow. Because I think one of the things that we want to demonstrate, and I think there's, a, there's a, going to be a class on music um, uh, by Jenny, and there's going to be some stuff on Kepler by some other people. Because the idea is to demonstrate that indeed there is such a thing as a human mind. And the human mind has a depth, a sensuousness, a reality, a potency, 
that, is, that cannot be replicated by any formal digital system or any machine or any animal that is completely unique in that respect and is something you can experience. And it's that power of the human mind which is society's capability to progress. It is what a republic, a nation, is supposed to promote. It is what natural law expresses as the directionality of any republic, any nation state. It is what's in the, the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. For us and our posterity. Toward an, a more perfect union. That means that it's a perfectible union. It's a republic which is supposed to express generationally, from generation to generation, a in continuing improvement, not only in the conditions of the population, but in the access to knowledge as power for the individual and society as a whole. That, in a sense, that's what we want to get across. We're not just talking about everything bad, although sometimes you've got to talk about bad. Okay? You can't ignore it. You can't avoid it. You can't let it scare you. Sometimes, too, too often people go out and they say, oh my God, everybody's nuts. You know, they're all in a cafe, internet cafe or whatever. Uh, you know, they, they won't respond. And of course, then you deal with the older generations and they're completely out of it. I mean, the older generation, the boomer generation, which created this mess in many respects, is also feeling sorry for itself because it's old and worn out. <laughs> okay? Yeah, come on. You, you, you talk about people 50 to 65 years old, even their sexual fantasies are kind of in black and white and boring, you know? <laughs> and besides that, they take forever, you know? It's, it's a, you know, it's a horrible thing to realize. Then, you know, then... Then you have the tweener generation, and they're just enraged at everybody. You know, so you, you got to get them out of the uh, out of the rage. You know, the typical tweener is one of these forty-year-old lawyers, stockbroker. You know, they just totally believe everything is the free market. They're sort of the quintessential neocon. You know, everything is the free market. Everything is who you beat, what you even con them out of. You make it, kill them for money, and don't give me any of that moral crap. You know, I don't want to hear it. I'm making a million bucks. <laughs> That's sort of the the, the 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 suspenders and the you know the sort of um, the buzz haircut. You know, not quite a bald head, but you know, they all look kind of neat and sharp. A little bit of gel in their hair. <laughs> You know, two cell phones and a Blackberry, you know. <laughs> yeah, you understand, you understand, I get to see a lot of these guys because I fly, you know, back and forth and I fly here. So, man, I tell you, there's nothing. They're like so full of self-importance. I mean, I've even gotten embarrassed now that I use the cell phone at the airport. See, for a long time I didn't. Now I do. I feel like I'm one of them, you know. I mean, <laughs> Hold it like you don't know what it is. Yeah, right. <laughs> but at least it's not a Blackberry. You know, you get these guys, they're going... <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they scroll down, scroll up. You know, <laughs> I have no idea how they can do that, you know. But anyway, the... Uh, so... <laughs> now, the way society works on these things is it's the younger generations. I mean, I wouldn't, seven years is not quite a generation. But there's something I think for people to realize. Uh, maybe a couple of things. Think about the following. A lot of the people who joined the LaRouche Youth Movement, let's say joined in the period 2002, 3, 4 roughly, in other words, we have a lot of people now who have been political, who have been in the movement for three, four, five years. They're in their mid to late 20s. One of the things that's interesting to me is the difference. Because when people came around, they did come around knowing that there was a political, there was a problem in the, in the, in the economy and in politics. Remember, you had 9-11 and 
you saw the coming into power of Cheney and Bush. But you were, were coming out of having experienced something a little bit different in the Clinton administration. At least it was somewhat human. It may have been wrong and stupid, but it was human. That's not a bad, that's not a small difference. Okay? It had a sense of history. It wasn't for total power for the presidency. Think about people who have been raised, let's say, from about 2001 to the present. Almost seven years, 9-11, Dick Cheney and George Bush. The collapse of the information bubble, the crash of the financial system. Now, this is the typical kind of danger. This is pessimism. This is cynicism. This is cultural backwardness. If this, this group of youth, 16, 17, 18, to the early mid-20s, is allowed to remain in this fantasy world, in this insane brainwashed world, which of course we're going to document, is run by people like Rupert Murdoch, and I'm not going to go through the, 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 the pamphlet that we're working on has material on this, is run by people like Bill Gates, is controlled, therefore, by intelligence networks, was it largely created as part of the revolution in military affairs, which was meant to create, in a sense, special forces, asymmetric zombie killers. If we let the generation sit there and not deal with reality, and it is there is a virtue in dealing with reality. Yes, we want to bring them we want to bring to them, a, a, we have to replace their deprived sense of what it is to be human with the distinguishing characteristics of what it is to be human. But we also have to do it while we bring them into dealing with reality. Because if we, if we don't, if we don't pose that challenge, then the collapse of the system and their and their impotent relationship to it will win them over to staying in the internet world, in the fantasy world, in the virtual world. You have to give people a sense of potency, a sense of at least the ability to act. You can't guarantee victory. It's not a question of posturing or, you know. But you have to give them a sense of the potential to address reality. Now, one of the things that's happened today, just along, well, I think a couple things have happened, just, and not just to put it as good news, but I think it is interesting. Because uh, it really isn't yet good news. It's just a step. What did, what, did, what did LaRouche propose? A complete firewall, not only to, to protect people from being kicked out, as I said, but also as the first step in asserting a principle to dominate and control the financial system. What are we saying? The financial system is under the regulation of the nation. Under the Constitution, the nation has the right and the responsibility to protect the general welfare of the population, particularly against rampantly immoral activity. So you assert a principle. It's more than the act. People get a little bit too hung up on every detail of the act. The legislation, if you look at Roosevelt's legislation in 1933, the first call was one page. It was, it was three paragraphs. The Homeowners and Lenders uh, Corporation was mm, maybe two or three pages. These are not 99 pages. I, maybe this is part of the problem of going up to Capitol Hill and the Boston State Legislature. Because you, know, you can always tell when law is getting bad. <laughs> When every bill is 900 pages. That's not regulation. You know, the, the U.S. Constitution is one of the shortest constitutions on the planet. I mean, it's about, what, 20 pages, something along those lines? Maybe less, depending on how it's printed. You know, the, the, the Constitution of some of the uh, uh, parliamentary systems in Europe are 250 pages. I mean, in fact, the Constitution of the Soviet Union was famous for being like, you know, hundreds of pages. It had every detail about how you were going to run everything. 
That's not how it works. It works on principles. So what did Roosevelt do when he came in and he declared the bank holiday? Well, it was March the 5th, 1933. He was asserting the right of the federal government to regulate the system, to control the system. And that's what he put in place over the next days ahead. What is Lynn doing with the HBPA? Homeowners and Bank Protection Act. He's saying the federal government has the right, under the constitutional law, to put the banking system in receivership under regulation. Until such time as proper values can be worked out, we're going to recapitalize the banks and so on and so forth. Now, interestingly enough, uh, you know, and what, what we found was that you could get nothing out of Congress. Nothing. They, wouldn't, they were scared. Why? Because to a large extent, the Democratic Party is run by Felix Rohatton, who controls Nancy Pelosi. And the, 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 you have a very interesting crossover in this in California, which really makes the point. Because Schwarzenegger, who has implemented the worst austerity policies, complete global warming freak, why austerity policies? Who runs Schwarzenegger? Who made Schwarzenegger the governor of California? Not the Republican Party. The Kennedy family. His wife. They voted to support him. And this is, I mean this literally. The family got together and effectively decided not to do anything to support the Democratic uh, candidate who they were running out of office, Gray Davis. So by implication, the Kennedy family supported the Schwarzenegger campaign. Who ran Schwarzenegger? Huh? Schwarzenegger was introduced to the financial world by Warren Buffett, George Schultz, and Victor Rothschild. George Schultz, just to make it, here's a connecto that does make sense to try to follow. George Schultz was the, the architect of the end of the Bretton Woods system in 1971 under Nixon which was an attack on the FDR policy of the general welfare. George Schultz worked under Friedman at the, at the University of Chicago. He's a complete monetarist economist. One of the architects of the present speculative system. Where was Schultz trained? He was trained at MIT by Kurt Lewin, and others on artificial intelligence, game theory, and the whole nine yards. So there's a connecto that's worth following out. Because it's a little bit beyond intriguing. And the fact of the matter is, who is Nancy Pelosi? Nancy Pelosi on two grounds connects to the K Kennedy side of the political, this Kennedy faction really, it's not all the Kennedys. Okay, Pelosi is tied to the Kennedy faction in California and out of her hometown in Baltimore. Her family was a political family in Baltimore. So what are we dealing with? That's why we couldn't move anything in the Congress. The, one of the key signatures of Nancy Pelosi, and that we're getting some interesting things, was she was the one who took the impeachment off the table. Cheney, impeachment, no. Now here's the irony in this. Today, on November the 6th, Dennis Kucinich put an impeachment resolution on the floor of the House. Now, you know, in the technical way that this works, the House is the grand jury. In an impeachment, the House brings the charges. They bring effectively the indictment. The Senate is the jury. So you bring charges under the House, and you have an impeachment proceeding before the Senate. So, in other words, it, it doesn't need the House and the Senate to bring the charges. Kucinich put a resolution on the floor of the Congress, and indeed it got moved, I won't go into all the details, but it was sent to the Judiciary Committee. Now, yesterday, John Conyers, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, said, we are seriously considering this impeachment proceeding. It is the most important issue in front of the population. Now, will he do anything? So far, they've done nothing. Because Pelosi said, no, we take it off the table. 
Now, we've moved to a situation where at least in the Judiciary Committee and publicly, Conyers has said this is a serious consideration. He hasn't taken it on completely. But we've moved a great deal. And the first person to call for Cheney's impeachment was Lyndon LaRouche in the fall of 2002, before the Iraq War. Now today, a congressman from West Philadelphia, Chaka Fatah, called for a six-month moratorium on foreclosures. It's on his website, at any rate. Okay? Now, he's not calling for a total foreclosure. He's not calling for saving the banks. It's got a ways to go. But this is the first step, the first motion out of Congress in months. Everything else they've done has been ridiculous. Barney Frank from good old Massachusetts, you know, Boston area, whatever. You know, he's going to save people in the future <laughs> by stopping predatory lending. First of all, I don't think he's going to stop it the way he wants to stop it, but what about the two million people who are going to be foreclosed on now? He's not going to stop that. And there's more to it, but that gives you a flavor of it. So what we're dealing with is we have in front of us the possibility, the potentiality to change the course of history, to intervene. And what we have to do is we have to bring a younger generation or a, another section of the youth generation into this political fight from the, from the standpoint of knowing what the powers of the human mind are. That's, that's the task in front of us. One good example of this, because sometimes I think people, say, you know, people do think linearly. Even, even people in the youth movement think linearly. They say, well, I don't see. How does this MySpace campaign lead to the HBPA? Show me the map. It's like you want a map quest, you know? <laughs> Except map quest, as everybody knows, is not very good. <laughs> So, how did we do this in, uh, a little over a year ago? Remember, last year, and this was good, even though it didn't work out the way we wanted it to completely, well, it, it still sits as the possibility of acting. Last year, in August and September, before the November election, the Democratic Party leadership was about to do what it is uniquely capable of. Losing unlosable elections. <laughs> okay. You know, they did this in 2004. You know, Bush was not the most loved guy in the world. Okay. Yet they managed to lose the election. You know, they get kicked around by the wildest things I've ever saw. Swift boat veterans, you know. I mean, here you're going to take a guy who's got purple hearts, bronze stars, and you're going to denounce him for being a coward. <laughs> and you got, who do you got running the country? Two draft dodgers. <laughs> you know, and you say to yourself, how could they get away with that? You have to have a sense, only the Democratic Party could let them do that. Okay? So in 2006, it, where the, the Republican leadership is even more hated, the Democratic Party, by the middle of the summer, late summer, was saying, well, maybe we'll win a razor-thin margin. That is, I'm not exaggerating. This is Rahm Emanuel, uh, uh, Pelosi, all these Maybe we'll win a slight, we'll, you know, we'll get a two-seat margin, a three-seat margin. But what happened? At this point, I think if, if people who are here look back on it, and they can communicate, uh, Lynn said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to mobilize the youth. We're going to go out. Uh, and at that point, you had this wild campus operation, which still goes on, but it, it wasn't as deep as what we're talking about now, uh, where you had, you know, Lynn Cheney, and uh, some people remember the names of these things, they were running around the campuses and this, you know, you can't say anything against the war, or, you know, we're going to monitor anybody who's against it. They ran a, a campus Gestapo, political correct Gestapo. So we put out a leaflet, is Goebbels, on, not a leaflet, a pamphlet, is Goebbels on your campus? And it went through the, uh, the uh, background of people like David Horowitz, Daniel Pipes, Lynn Cheney, etc., and the whole neocon apparatus that was basically 
bring, clamping down on any political opposition. And they're still going around. They're the ones going around now on this campus tour on Islamo-fascism. You know, all Muslims are fascists except for a few who listen to what we tell you to do. You know, that kind of thing. Okay? But we, we went on the campus... And I know, well, okay, this is, it's true, these guys are making life tough for us, so the campus work isn't going that well, we need to fight back, but how is this going to change events? Well, what happened was, as it turned out, the Democratic Party won about a 30-seat turnover in the Congress, not a 5-seat turnover. 30 seats, took about a 30-seat majority, and could have done about probably twice that good if, they, if the Democratic Party itself had taken, there were at least 10 seats that they didn't fight for, that they only lost by 1 or 2 percent. Well, what happened? By running this operation on the campuses, we turned a youth vote loose. And when polls were done, after the election, this, the one factor that stood out as completely different was about 2 million extra youth votes, more than what would have been expected under normal circumstances, which went about two-thirds Democratic. Two-thirds, yeah, about two-thirds. Okay? That made the difference in 10 or 15 or 20 elections, which turned a razor-thin change into a near landslide. Now, effectively, we're saying do the same thing now but on a deeper and larger scale. Because now we're getting to something more fundamental. First of all, even in the last year, and remember, don't underestimate when you look at people and say, oh, they're no good. Don't underestimate the demoralizing effect of another year of Cheney and Bush, the backing off of the Democratic Party, the threat of an Iran war. Look, probably the one thing that is pushing people to go for the impeachment as compared to before is not the Iraq war. It's not that Cheney's a no-good bastard. It's because of the threat of an Iran war. That there are increasing numbers, even Republicans, who recognize that if they do nothing, then they're going to get a war. And this is going to get worse and worse and worse. In one sense, Bush is right. It's going to be World War III, but he and Cheney are going to cause it. And you have to look at the way the world is reacting on this kind of stuff. China is saying they won't go along on the Iran sanctions, and probably even more importantly, the Russians are basically saying we won't go along with anything. In effect, we're pushing Russia back into a certain kind of Cold War where Putin is saying publicly, we are prepared to defend ourselves against what the United States might do. We can't protect the world, but we can protect ourselves. This is something that there was no need for, and it's only some, it's something we can stop now. But that's what's going on. Now, a year of that, pushing ever more uh, of the youth into this uh, fantasy world, this virtual world, creates a new level of danger, but also a moment where we can intervene. We can act, but we've got to take the problem on as it really is. And as I said, this is the virtual world of the entire financial system. Frankly, at a deeper level, which maybe gets a little bit to things we'll continue in the discussion, at a deeper level, this MySpace, Facebook, call it what you want. I mean, and, and, and keep in mind, look at the, the number of people that have gone on Facebook and MySpace in the last year. The, I mean, it's only in the, about the last year that this has become a predominant issue. It's only in about the last year that Rupert Murdoch and uh, uh, Gates got involved in it. I mean, all this is, and it, what is it? It's all speculated on a rate of growth. Remember, Facebook does about, I don't know what it was, you know, a few tens of millions of dollars in business. And its stock value now is $15 billion. 
just like the bubble of the early 20, uh, of the early, uh, you know, uh, 2001, 2000, 2000, the Y2K bubble. The idea is this is the wave of the future. This is where everybody's going. Now, the real issue to get at is that this coherence of a completely deregulated, complete free market, insane system. And in fact, you know, if you go back to Adam Smith, the granddaddy, supposedly, although not really, but the, you know, the granddaddy of the pre of free market, free enterprise, free trade outlooks. What does he say about the human? individual's ability to intervene in history. Well, in the theory of moral sentiments in 1759, he says, human beings should make no effort to intervene. All you are are your desires, your impulses, your, your, your sexual pleasures, and you should let those act. And let the invisible hand determine the outcome. I mean, you know, in one sense, the problem with this digital world, this, uh, this deregulated, inhuman world, is as old as the British Empire. And I mean the British Empire. Yes, it's Venetian. But what we live under, really, to this day, is typified by Adam Smith, 1759-1776. He was the, uh, one of the enemies of the American Revolution. The Wealth of Nations was in part written as a polemic against the independence of the, United, of, the, of the colonies. And his view was, okay, be independent, but stay under the regime of free trade. Don't develop your industrial powers. Don't act as human beings. Don't intervene into history. Have no conscious purpose. That gets in the way. You know, it goes back to Mandeville, you know, private vi uh, vices, public virtues. Mandeville's view, who was a precursor of Smith, was that indeed it was people's desires and vices, their desire, their greed, their sexual desires, their desires to get away with things, which fueled the economy. Because it fueled their desire to consume, therefore it fueled their desire, their, the, the, uh, the value of financial instruments and so on and so forth. So this is, at one sense, as old as the hills, as old as the British Empire. And in outlook, this is the idea of chattel slavery, which came from, uh, in particular, Locke. It didn't come from Locke, but he was a theorist of it in the modern era. This is the British system, which, remember, the British were, were wonderful. The British abolished slavery in the early 19th century but they supported it in the United States, in the South. They traded with it. They nearly backed the Confederacy. They did back the Confederacy. They never went public with it. Lincoln knew it. So what is this outlook? What is a utilitarian outlook? Which is most of what you guys get in school. You don't get anything but this anymore. Everything else is, is, that's not the system. You don't want to talk about the American system. It's written out of history. You don't want to talk about protectionism. You don't want to talk about the general welfare. You don't want to talk about government intervention because we now know that's all bad. And the ruling system is total deregulation, private greed, free markets, globalization. Outsource everything. Outsource the military. In a sense, we've outsourced the military. Not in, even in the way that people think. Yes, we've privatized it. Yes, we have black water. But it's worse than that. We also, you realize how many people who join the professional army are immigrants? Cheap labor. We, we're essentially hiring an army of people who are desperate to become citizens. And they think that the way to become a citizen is to go into the army and kill a few people. And that's the way you get to be a citizen.
But what is a utilitarian outlook? The only way you can place a value on anything is how much people desire it or how much they wish to avoid it. Pleasure, pain. This is Jeremy Bentham. Bentham was, was a part of the intelligence network under Shelburne of the British Empire. He was directly involved in the French Revolution. Jeremy Bentham is the father of utilitarian ethics, if you're taught in these courses and whatnot. Bentham, Mill, and so on. Now, how do you establish value in a system? You, uh, you establish value based on whether people desire it or not. Now, how does this now then work in the financial system? Well, you might say, well, you, you know, you're looking for things that people want, and uh, and you, you're gonna you're you sort of gonna you know try to get involved in selling that because the price is gonna go up and so on and so forth. But it's actually more than that. You begin to bet. You make you make bets on whether or not people will like it. You don't even invest in producing what they like. You bet on whether or not the price will go up. You make an investment in a financial instrument which is based on whether or not the price of some other instrument goes up or down. And then there's more to it. You hedge your bets. Because you, you think you might lose on one, you try to gain on another. Then you, then you get people who are involved in making money Making, uh, acting financially in managing and coordinating the bets. That's what most banks are into right now. That's what a hedge fund is. The hedge fund manager doesn't invest in anything. He manages other people's bet bets. And so on and so forth. The whole thing is a completely disassociated system, which is based on electronic transfers and computer programs that tell you what the likely trends are. Now I'll tell you something. The way this, 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 this thing actually works is the model that they use for human beings are digital systems. You know, in other words, like or not, you, you like it or you don't like it. And then you can get how much you like it or how little you like it. Then you, begin, then you put into this certain kinds of statistical trends based on these evaluations and you make bets on financial instruments. Now supposedly this allocates risk and so on. It doesn't. Because you're now in the realm where people can try to manipulate these things and where if, 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 since all these computers' trends are the same, when the system goes, when the price of housing goes down, all the computer values go down. So we have a system that's completely insane, that really is based not on what it claims to be based on, but is based ultimately on the ability to loot people, to reduce living standards, to steal from health care, to steal from housing, to steal from living standards, to steal from the third world. And the whole system is that way. China won't make it if the United States collapses, and to a certain extent they know it. It's worth also noting a very interesting event. Today, Lyndon LaRouche addressed a conference uh, in Washington uh, on China policy, which was, at, which, was at the, uh, uh, which was addressed by the Chinese ambassador and a number of other experts on China, later on by people in the Brookings Institute. So Lin is in the middle of this whole debate, and in particular, he's in the middle of what's being discussed in China about how to deal with the financial crisis in the United States. Now, the, the more fundamental sense of this, to look at it a little bit differently, it, and I'll, I'll only reference this now a little bit, and then we, we, we can see. But the other way to look at this is what is a computer? 
In other words, what are you, since you're basically interacting with a computer, it may construct personalities for you and so forth, what are you interacting with? Well, in its simplest sense, I'll tell you, the, the, the simplest idea, or let's put it this way, not just the simplest, the basic idea of a, compu- a digital computer. And there is a difference. Now, one of, the, uh, one of the things you'll see in the pamphlet we're putting out is that not all computers are digital computers. There are computers that do reflect in a different way. They're, they're not as fast, but they do reflect in a different way a, uh, a connection to an actually f- a, a physical principle a physical process, a continuum of change. And a lot of these are based on replicating certain kinds of um, uh, physical curves and physical actions. Catenary curves, exponential curves, and physical actions that reflect least action principles that are replicated in the computer as as a physical process that's meant to represent those changes. Now, I'll give you an example to think about. For example, a thermometer is an analog computer in a simple-minded sense. Right? In other words, the thermometer is based on a connection to a physical relationship to a, uh, some physical process that causes a change that allows you to measure certain things. Another good example of an analog process is records as compared to compact disks. Okay? I mean, a record actually uh, replicates the continuous process of changes in the sound waves. That's why in many ways, though this might be, in many ways, a record, even though it's got a lot of garbage in it, does give you a better replication of the actual music, even with the flaws. Because when you when you because what happens well we'll, we'll come to this or you know th- th- those are I- those are interesting examples so it's not and and let me make a mild point though I don't want to uh, too much um, you know there is a virtue in rapidity if you're doing calculations this is why people like Leibniz was interested in this in his own way Kepler. And others. If you've got to do a lot of number crunching, there's nothing wrong with having something that crunches numbers very fast. It's that simple. And since for many, for, for many calculational reasons, there's no problem in having something that crunches so many numbers so fast that even though it's not an actual representation of the physical process, it gives you approximate numbers that are good enough for the engineering that you need. There's nothing wrong with having that. That, Those are helpful devices. Though you always have to watch things a little bit. You know, because a lot of the problems you have with computers like Mathematica and some of these other computer processes that try to replicate geometrical uh, representations, they are often flawed and they'll do weird things on you at a certain point. Okay? Because, you know, they will jump they will jump to infinity and jump off the screen and so therefore you have, sometimes you're limited in the replication that you can get. But granted enough that for most of what you want to do you can get some interesting things. The problem is not so much do you use this as a number crunching device. The pro- and, and you can you can do some things with computers that you might say try to model uh, more complex processes. So you can do a structured hierarchy of the computers. You can do massively parallel processing. You can do certain kinds of things. But you got to have in mind who's behind the computer. What's the program? What's the direction? It's a human mind that guides it. If you begin to think that the computer is a mind, and I'll give you some funny examples of this, lest you think I exaggerate, <laughs> it's really no different than thinking the human, uh, that a chimpanzee is a human, uh, has a human mind. 
or as a precursor of the human mind. Or thinking, for example, the kind of mistake that gets made is thinking that what animals do is somehow just a few, uh, an infinite number of steps, but it's all steps away from human beings do. For example, animals, here's a tough one for you, animals make tools. Or they use things that you can say is the beginnings of a sign of tools. And, and, and frankly, all kinds of animals do things that you might call tools. You know, like it's been documented that ravens will drop stones on things to break them. And, you know, they must have some idea, you know, they, they, they're flying a little bit high or whatever the story is. Obviously, people have these ideas with chimpanzees. People have seen this now with gorillas. Chimpanzees will strip a twig and get termites out of a termite hill. Or perhaps even one of the more interesting ones is um, they'll use a leaf like a sponge. Like, so they, they, they crumple the leaf up, and because the leaf, when it's crumpled, has more absorbency. You get a greater surface area. So they crumple the, the leaf up, and they can take water, and they can drink it. They've even apparently learned to use certain things um, in certain limited areas uh, that help them with their digestion. That's at least one view. Okay. Now, here's the, uh, the reason I'm, I'm, ex- I'm going to exaggerate this. Because there's a lot of ways in which if you reduce human activity to an animal-like condition, you can get confused. But there is no animal that does what human beings do. (laughs) Because human beings don't operate off of creating a single tool in a single area. Like one, I saw one group of these uh, anthropologists who tried to argue that there were chimpanzee cultures. Now why? It's an interesting point. Because they found chimpanzees in different localities that made different tools and hunted differently. In other words, what, the, what, these, what these chimps are doing, and you know, they are relatively more complicated creatures. What these chimps are doing is they're finding certain means of acting on their environment to extract you know, food and so on and so forth. Okay? But what you don't get from a chimpanzee is they don't operate from the standpoint of a universal causal principle. They don't act on something from the standpoint that they've discovered something about the way the universe as a whole works. And that principle allows them to create machines that change the tools that they have to act differently on nature. So there's no universality, there's no sense of an idea that these creatures have. And if they did what they did for a zillion years, they wouldn't get anywhere. They've done this for a zillion years. There's no reason to think, for example, that chimpanzees haven't made twigs for hundreds of thousands of years. Okay? They didn't just learn this yesterday. There's no sense of progress and development based on the discovery of causal principles. And in one sense, it's completely obvious. You know, it, you feel stupid even, you know. They don't communicate an idea. One young woman documented the sounds of chimpanzee language. And what she came up with was 27 different pant hoots. You know, because chimpanzees kind of pant and hoot. That's the way, that's the way they communicate things. And that's the range of complexity. In fact, it is a very interesting thing. You know, I think for because you guys do so much music, there is there is an interesting thing that you know people are often fascinated by animal sounds. You know. There's no doubt, for those of you who have had the experience, you know, getting out somewhere in the <coughs> wilds of somewhere and listening to coyotes and wolves howl at the moon or whatever they howl at, is an eerie experience. Okay? It's, it's fascinating. It's something that is worth experiencing. Okay? Just because it's one of those things. You know, it, it gives you a funny sense of the world out there. But... Animal sounds, you listen to chimpanzees, they can't make the same kinds of sounds that human beings can. They don't have the flexibility in the uh, uh, 
uh, in the mouth, in the larynx. They don't have the same shape of the roof of the mouth. Human beings, you might say as a biological organism, have developed to be able to communicate ideas. So the range of sound of the human voice, the way in which the human voice modulates, the way in which the human voice resonates sound, the way in which it interacts with the space around it, is, is all organized to communicate ideas. In some sense, if you take music, and in particular, the, the use of music to communicate ideas, and the way in which people work together in a chorus or a quartet to communicate ideas, that is the fourth domain. That's the, the domain of the social communication of ideas and development of ideas. In a sense, in music, you're giving people an idea of the way ideas develop. And you, you, you base it on a biological organism, the human voice. But it's a biological organism that is the seat of human uh, mentation. Now, so in that sense, you know automatically, animals don't do that. They don't even come close. In a certain sense, they won't simply evolve to do that in another two million years. Now, the, the, the idea that developed in the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, I think had a very perverted, pessimistic development. Because the way this worked and I think it's a good deal of the problem that we have uh, in science today. And we have many, many real problems to address. And we're going to make the necessary breakthroughs in nuclear physics. If we're going to be able to produce the necessary changes to create raw materials or the types of raw materials that we need, we're going to need to make serious developments in science. Now, we're not there yet. But in terms of fundamental principles, there's been very little development in science since the early part of the 20th century. Now, what we're doing, what Lynn is doing, and this is, I think, where people should see that we can communicate to people a different sense of humanity. What, we're, what, what Lynn is, is doing is, let's take, and I'll, actually, let, let, let's, how do we get at where we are now? How do we establish the basis for new areas of scientific progress? And this includes biophysics and so forth. We're not going to develop in biophysics from the standpoint of the human genome. It is a much deeper process in human, the human, the human physiology, in human development, and biological development that we need to uh, that we need to get at. Now. The problem is if you try to jump in at a certain point and say, let's correct the problems that we face, you can't do it. Why not? Because we've lost the strand of development. And I think this is really, this, I'm going to get at a little bit, this gets at what, why this whole question of the digital world is so important. Because it, it really is all part of uh, the effort to bury the real history of human progress and human scientific development, as it is an effort to bury the idea that the human mind is unique and creative, as you, has a unique place in the universe. Now, by unique, I don't mean that I know for sure there aren't other creatures like us, but what, what I do know is if there's anything else in the universe like us, it will be like us. It won't be just some weird, bizarre intelligence that we can't comprehend. Intelligence in the universe is intelligence in the universe. So if there's anything out there, we'll be able to find a way to communicate with it. 
Because what we've demonstrated is that human development, human knowledge, the architecture of human, uh, the human mind and the, the way the human physical organism has become the seat of the human mind is coherent with the way the universe develops. Otherwise, our discoveries, our progress would not occur. Now, what Lynn is saying is, in order to be able to get to where we are, so to speak, to get to the right starting point, we've got to re-establish the pathway or the development of uh, true scientific discovery and cultural development in human history. That's the reason to do Kepler. It's not like a cult of Kepler. It's not like some fixation on Kepler because, you know, he was an interesting, strange guy and he believed all, like, as, you know, he believed all these things and we're defending it. Kepler is a transparent case of how the human mind goes through scientific discovery. And he has the virtue that he relates it to you. He takes you down these wrong paths. He does the calculations. And he says, well, here's the problem. And even at the end, when he solved the problem, he says, we need a way of communicating this. We need a language to express this kind of scientific discovery. He calls for a mathematics. But as a language that is appropriate to the changes in science that he's made. And thus we end up getting the calculus. And other developments. Higher order transcendentals. All come out of Kepler. And the challenges that he poses. So what Lynn is saying is, take this course of the major breakthroughs in scientific development. Kepler, Leibniz, Gauss, Riemann, etc. And you will essentially put yourself back to where science was as it was making its greatest density of breakthroughs. And where we can reestablish that pathway to solve some of the problems that need to be conceptually solved. To be able to properly understand quantum events. Not that these things don't happen. They do. But the question is, as Einstein put it, how do we discover, how do we approach it from a causal standpoint? From the principles that guide it. We may need a new conception of principles. We may need all kinds of things. But it's this standpoint, this direction in scientific discovery that will get it for us. And yet, instead of trying to jump in the middle of the 20th century and say, let's solve this problem, let's solve that problem, you've got to go to the actual scientific method. But, he, but you have to go through the actual discoveries to see how discoveries are made, to experience that, to know that as a creative power of the human mind. I'll just read you one quote I was going to just to give you an idea how much this is at the center of things. This is from a speech that Einstein gave. And, you know, there's a problem with... I, Einstein was, was the last of this tradition. Einstein, Gödel, maybe a few people who came a little bit... Uh, that, were, that worked with them. But that's about it. Planck. They weren't... And it's also... We're not, they weren't right about everything. So don't... People will look... These guys up and say, oh my God, he's wrong about this, he's wrong. But you get a, you get a tendency, a, tre a trend in the way they think, the tradition they find themselves in. That Einstein would say that the keys to science are Kepler and Riemann, even though he talks about Newton at times as a great thinker. Other times he expresses his disagreements with Newton. But this is a, a perfect case, a, a little bit off, unexpected. He's giving a speech in 1922 and he's talking about how he began to get on the course of general relativity the discovery of general relativity theory which is about 1915-1916 now it's yeah you know, and so he says in this if all accelerated systems are equivalent and what he means is you know uh that there's no priority to any particular accelerated system. There's no absolute, there's no ground system. Every system as it accelerates is taken as it's, uh, uh, on its own. Okay? It, it's equivalent to any other, you just, it's equivalent to any, you can take that as your perspective, you can take another accelerated system as a perspective. 
and all of them are equivalent in status, so you need a sense of physical law that's invariant between all the systems. The laws are the things that hold for all these different rates of acceleration, okay? Including rotations and whatnot. So... What do you mean by systems? Well, you, you just take... You, a system is somewhat arbitrary, but you, in other words, let's say you're on, a, you're on a, a, a vehicle that's accelerating. You can make that the, the, the standpoint from which you're, doing, you're, you're looking at things. You can take... Someone else can take another system that's accelerating or in linear motion or whatever. Okay, and what you're looking for is not... It's not subjective in the way people say. You're looking for something that's invariant amongst all the systems. What has to remain unchanged as a reflection of these motions? Okay? Now, if all accelerated systems are equivalent, then Euclidean geometry cannot hold in all of them. I.e., the end of Euclidean geometry, because his point is that we have no basis for picking one system prior as prior to another. We've got to find the principles that act in all these systems, okay, that are, that are equivalent in all the systems. So he says, if you do that, you're finished with Euclid. Because in effect, acceleration is reflected as curvature. What you're going to find is, in a, each of these systems has a different curvature relative to, one, uh, to each other. Okay? So he says, to throw out geometry and keep physical laws is equivalent to describing thoughts without words. Now think of Kepler saying, okay, we've got a physical process, we need a language to express this, to use. Okay? Uh, we must search for words before we can express thoughts. What must we search for at this point? This problem remained insoluble to me until 1912 when I suddenly realized that Gauss's theory of surfaces holds the keys for unlocking this mystery. I realized that Gauss's surface coordinates had a profound significance. However, I did not know at that time that Riemann had studied the foundations of geometry in an even more profound way. I suddenly remember that Gauss's theory was contained in the geometry course given by Geyser when I was a student. I realized the foundations of geometry have physical significance. My dear friend, the mathematician Grossman, was there when I returned from Prague to Zurich. From him, I learned for the first time about Ricci and later about Riemann. So I asked my friend whether my problem could be solved by Riemann's theory, namely, whether the invariance of the line element could, be completely, deter could completely determine the quantities I had been looking for. And the answer was yes. Now, in one sense, I really had to give you a sense. That's where we stood in 19... 22. That, or that was a reflection on that process. Now, of course, there's more to this. Because we have to look at the whole question of, uh, you know, Einstein and Planck and quantum, and there, there's things beyond my, certainly, my uh, uh, area of knowledge. Okay? But I do know these are things we have, to, we have to situate ourselves to be able to expand on this background of, sci of history of scientific discovery. Because if you look at this, this is the tradition that gave us the most uh, fantastic development of science at the end of the 18th into the 19th century. This is the development of electromagnetic theory, chemistry, physical chemistry, crystallography, everything. And it all comes out of this tr uh, strand of history. I mean, you, there are different, you know, they're not all completely clear. Gauss certainly keeps things quiet. They're not all as definitive as they might be. But you can discern very clearly where these guys are going and where they're coming from. These guys are all based on Leibniz. Riemann was based on Leibniz. Gauss based himself in Leibniz, or a tradition that was grounded in Leibniz, Bernoulli. Riemann was good. And Einstein, by the way. Einstein uh, considered himself uh, to be a proponent of Leibniz in many respects. So we have to... Now, what is exactly the point? Well, what is Riemann? Riemann says there is no Euclidean geometry. What, but he's not just non-Euclidean, as you're often taught. What's a basic non-Euclidean geometry? A non-Euclidean is you change an axiom. But it's still an axiomatic system. You're just looking for the right axiomatic system. You might use more than one. You might use 
a spherical system. You might use a different system. You might say, I'm going to use any number of these systems. But you, geometry is an axiomatic system. What does Riemann say? He says, geometry is not an axiomatic system. In fact, if you want to find something interesting, and I'm just going to refer to Russell in Principia, actually in an introduction that he writes, he just basically assumes that you're always looking for an axiomatic system. The only question, he's talking about arithmetic, the only question is, you know, how fundamental can you make your axioms? Everybody has to accept some self-evident axiomatic truths. The question in a certain sense is, where do you stop? That's not what Riemann says, no. And by the way, the whole arithmetization of mathematics, which is Principia Mathematica, and ultimately it is the digital system, is based on a Euclidean axiomatic model. The whole idea is the only truth that you can get is the formal aspects of a Euclidean system. A system of axioms, definitions, and rules of deduction. And it becomes logicized at the end of the 19th and into the 20th century. But that's the model. What does Riemann say? Riemann says, indeed, there is no fundamental axiomatic system. In fact, physical geometry is the succession of systems. Moreover, that's what the geometry is. You're looking for principles, which are the dimensions of your geometry. And you look for the way in which the intermixing of these principles generate boundary conditions, new orders of transcendentals, and demand new boundary conditions, changes in the geometry, changes in your discovery. And he says explicitly there is no axiomatic system. That's been the flaw in geometry, he says, in the very introductory words for 2,000 years. Now, to get it, now, Riemann was attacked in the middle of the 19th century by a group of people who insisted, and not maybe not all, you get into a mixed area here, but there's, there's a core of attack, which is really carried out ultimately by Russell, who, who goes after Leibniz, Riemann, and so on and so forth, Kepler. What is, Riemann is attacked because basically the idea of a physical sense of geometry and discovery is not precise enough. It's not 100% certain. He doesn't give logically formal proofs. And indeed, there's an interesting case of this where um, in the infamous case of the Dirichlet principle, which has been raised, I mean, put in a certain sense, all Dirichlet's principle states is that for any function that you like, it, the function is defined by the maxima and the minima, by the singularities, by the points of change. What's a maximum? A maximum is when the curve is going up and goes down, or the surface. A change in direction. The minimum is the same thing, except in the other direction. Okay. Now, what, what Dirichlet is saying is if you know the singularities and the limits, that is, you, you know, in a sense, if you're dealing with physical principles, how the physical principles bound or make finite what you're dealing with. So, for example, if you have a gravitational, you have curvature, you know that there's a certain limit to the dispersal of matter in the universe. So there, there are boundary conditions. Now, well, and of course this applies to many other things. Uh, for example, in, in electrical circuits or electromagnetic phenomena, you create a field, that field has a certain boundary. The boundary is defined by the electromagnetic laws and the motions in it. Now, what um, Riemann used the Dirichlet's principle is to say that if you have the number of singularities and the boundary conditions, you know the essential character of the physical space you're dealing with. And of course, you know, um, 
well, th th this ultimately ends up being topological considerations and so forth. How many holes? Like, what's the difference between the torus and a sphere? Well, the torus has essentially a hole in it, a singularity, that even if you don't punch the hole all the way through. That creates a different... Now you've created a different kind of surface. Until you get to that, you don't have really a different surface. You have a distorted sphere. But it, has, it still maintains all the character of the sphere. Now, what, is, what was one of the critiques of Riemann? Well, from a formal standpoint, you don't always know whether there's a minimum. Why? Because you can create formally a surface that gets infinitely closer to the minimum, but never gets there. So how do you know the minimum exists? Now, formally, you don't. For example, if you take, if you take the area of a triangle and you swing <coughs> the leg down, is there a minimum area? No, it gets closer and closer to zero. Okay? So, Weierstrass says to Riemann, you, haven't, you don't have an existence proof. You don't have a formal proof of the existence of the singularity. Now, Oh, here's, but what's Riemann's answer? What? You're saying that, that they're not considering when the triangle gets to the line, they're not considering that a minimum? Well, it never gets there. You can get infinitely closer and infinitely closer and infinitely closer. Nothing stops you. Nothing ever gets you to zero. You get infinitely closer to zero, but you never get to zero. There's, a, there's other examples like that. Kind of like the Zeno pyramid. Yeah. Right? Now, what does Riemann say? In any physical process, there is a delta. You're not going to go. You're not going to go below that. You're not going to go to zero. There's an actual finite minimum. Because we're dealing with real physical processes. I mean, you get this in all kinds of things. You get this in the black hole theory. The black hole is not. Technically, mathematically, a black hole is the entire universe in a point. It doesn't exist. Now, there is, there are wild and interesting phenomena to look at. But let's really look at them. Because it doesn't go to zero. It doesn't go to a point. In fact, as we learned, radiation can escape black holes under certain conditions, etc., etc. Now, they try to handle all this mathematically and smooth it all out. But the fact is, we're dealing with something completely different. Now, here's the interesting point. How does this formal system work? The idea is, all truth, all knowledge, has to be 100% certain. Now, think about this, in terms of the way it affects the mind. Is, if it's true, is it 100% true? And can you prove that it's true? Can you prove it for an absolute certainty? Well, the only knowledge that's absolutely certain, and you'll even get this in Leibniz, but he uses it differently, is what analytic truths. Formally deduced truths. You have an axiom system, you have rules of deduction, boom. But here's the problem, as anybody will tell you. What about the truth of the axioms? <laughs> That's, that's a matter of, you know, reality. Ah, so what we, what, what, what we will demand as a standard, and this was, you get some decent people who make this kind of mistake, I think, the Hilbert and so forth. Okay, then what we know for sure is the formal character of truth. We can develop a logical system which is the form of an axiomatic system. And we know that forms of statements that have this character are true. So, for example, it take a, a, a case, a simple-minded case. Um, um, all men are animals. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is an animal. And this is Aristotle, but you know, who had a crazy system. But you know, now what's true about that? Is Socrates a man? Are all men animals? We don't know if that's true. But we know that the formal structure of the statement is true. If 
all men are animals. If Socrates is a man, then Socrates is an animal. If A, then B. If B, then C. If A, then C. And in effect, what do they get? This is how you get the idea of non-Euclidean geometries. You basically say, okay, can we demonstrate that if we change the axiom, let's say the parallel axiom or postulate, does, the, does that still give us a formal system that's consistent, that's true, if we use the same rules of deduction? Can I come up for, with a model for that axiomatic system? Yes. In fact, I can come up with all kinds of different models for all kinds of different axioms. So the formal character of the axiomatic system is true. It's consistent. Now, in effect, this became the model for a formal systems. The idea was arithmetize mathematics. And the idea was turn all of mathematics into the axioms of arithmetic and show you can deduce all of mathematics from the simple axioms of arithmetic. And people like Piano and Frege came up with this. And Russell writes Principia Mathematica. Now, there's a very interesting thing that comes up on this. Which, you know, so I'm not going to... I mean, the, 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 someday, probably not, you know, you can look at some of this. It's a, it's a formal language. Now, it goes beyond Aristotle. You know, they have what they call universal quantifiers and existential quantifiers and uh, pro relational characteristics and so on and so forth. So you can write some very funny looking things. Although it all ultimately boils, boils down to truth tables, which you may have seen. You know what a truth table looks like? <laughs> Here's one. Okay, what's the truth table for if P then Q? Because all we want is the form of a statement. Okay, well here's the truth table. P can be true or false, and Q can be true or false. Okay, now if P is true and Q is true, then the statement is true. That makes sense. Now if P is false and Q is false, what do you get? Hmm? It's true. Mm -hmm. true. Why? Because the condition isn't met. So, if it rains tomorrow, I'll go to the store. If it doesn't rain, I can do whatever I want. It's all true. This is the thinking, okay? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Now, true, false. This is a different combination. False. False. <laughs> False, true. True. What? It's not met. Again, since the condition isn't met, okay? Yeah, you could argue about these things. But anyway, so you get it. Now, now here's where it gets a little bit interesting to realize where we're headed with this. What does that remind you of? Don't worry whether you agree with how they assign the value. What does it remind you of? One, zero, zero, one. Zero, one. It's a binary system. It's a completely binary system. You can create truth t trees off of this. And then you create a, a, a language. So you can have P, then Q, then R. And you, could, you can create a truth table based on first find out if this is true or false, and you know how it relates to that. And, you get by you'll get a, a, a power function. It's two cube with three letters. Is eight different combinations, and so on and so forth. But it's a binary system. Now, what is Ru what does Russell do? <laughs> Russell creates a more expanded language, which includes universal statements, like if for every x, if x is green then Y is purple. <clears throat> so it looks something like this. For any X in the domain, 
if X is pink, then X is uh, grass or something. I don't know. You know, okay? <laughs> Has a certain predicate to it. Okay? Now, all right, so on the one hand, if you now treat this as a kind of long truth table, you have to say for each case, take every X in the universe, find out if it's true or false. If it's not pink, then it doesn't matter. If it is pink, you have to see if it's grass. Now, if that's true for everything in the universe, it's a true statement. Okay? And so on and so forth. This is, I mean, it can, it, you can make all kinds of... Con now, how does this really work? It's also binary. X is either P or not P. X is either grass or not grass. So, in effect, you take the entire system of arithmetic and you reduce it to a formal system that itself has a, is characteristically binary. Yes, no, true, false, on, off, which of course is the basis for the computer. It's just an on, off switch. On, off is yes, no. And effectively, the entire circuitry of a computer is just how many, how many uh, um, I don't know what you call them, terminals, how many yes, no, sw how many switches can you fit into the space? And the program tells you how to run the course of switches and then what it's supp supposed to turn on. That's the inside of a computer, effectively. There's more to it. But that all the, the, what's interesting about the computer is the hardware. For example, what makes computers possible is the thinness of the chips, of the slices of the chip, and how many circuits you can get on it, and how and how and how much you can control the heat. Because if, if you get too many circuits and too much electrical flow, you run it too fast, it's going to burn up. So all this is materials. It's molecular and atomic physics. That's where it all is. The software is just a little bit of, you know, cleverness. And it can be complicated. I'm not denying that. And it can take a certain intelligence. But that's all it is. So, effectively, what are you dealing with? You're, you, when you deal with the co a digital computer system, you're dealing with a reduction an effort to reduce thought to a, to a formal deductive system based on a, a binary code. Hmm? You're saying this is well, like any, any formal system? This is, like the, this is like the effect of reducing these things? Well, it's, it, for our purposes, it's the formal systems that are being used. People have worked on other kinds of formal systems. But that's a different area to get into, and I don't think there's anything particularly interesting. Well, well I was curious, because you're <coughs> just to try to figure out how this like, affects like, the human mind generally, like how some of this stuff, how, how this could be a way of, a way of thought. You know, it like, is a way of thought. You know, yeah. It is. Look, what I'm getting across is this is the way you think when you're on a computer. This is what the computer is doing. You know, it's why, for example, computers can have no fuzzy edges to them. It's why, for example, the example I've often given, if you go to a movie and you watch special effects, and if they don't do something to smudge the print, you can tell it's a special effect because it's too sharp. No human vision doesn't work that way. Human vision has spherical perspective. So it doesn't work. So you have, to, you have to smudge it up a little bit to make it look real, ironically enough, even though everybody's so weirdly proud of these things. The fact of the matter is, no creature moves like these creatures move. But, you know, since we don't have much of an example of, you know, dinosaurs, and everybody knows these are computer-generated effects, you're just fascinated by how close it gets. There's an irony in these things. It's like a suspension of belief, or a suspension of disbelief. But the truth of the matter is, the point to, to look at is, this is, the, the idea is this is superior to Riemann. 
This is superior to Kepler. This is why people say it was Newton and not Kepler. Because Newton had a formal mathematical uh, deductive proof of what Kepler discovered. So what happens is, is you take an actual discovery, which of course could not be formally there, or it wouldn't be a discovery. You can't discover something in a formal system. All you can do is deduce what's already there. It's completely tautological. Everything is in the axioms and you might feel clever in deducing something. But you haven't discovered anything that any machine couldn't discover. Give it long enough time. And you've essentially reduced the actual physical process to a finite linear process. To a, a, a deductive formal system that's essentially binary. Digital. That's what it means. I mean, it doesn't have to be binary. Digital means digits. <laughs> Some finite number of choices. So you, you can build a finite system. You, you know, they, they do fuzzy logics. <laughs> so they throw in another value. You get a 0, 1, 2 where one is maybe, and zero is yes, and I mean no, and two is yes. They have things called modal logics, which involve things like possibility and necessity. But even while people get fascinated with that, what happens is they just give certain numerical values to possibility and necessity. So you can get more complicated formal systems. But you don't get, the essence of it isn't even the binary question. That just shows you how limited this is. The essence of it is precisely the idea, and so that you're reducing truth because you're looking for certainty. Isn't that, I, I find that wonderfully ironic. The demand for absolutely clear and certain knowledge, 100% irrefutable, reduces you to formal logical deductive systems that are essentially empty. But you can know that if you follow the rules, your conclusion flows from your assumptions. And if your assumptions are true, then you have something that, apparently, that should be for, true. That is formally true. Of course, your problem is that that may not be the way the world works. You may have left the principle out. Okay? Something may have intervened to throw it off. What do you do then? So effectively, the real core of this is if you, th if you go on the internet and you think you're dealing with something human, that is what screws you up. And so in particular, the idea that your social life could be on a computer is insane. Because you can't represent a human being on the computer. You can't relate to a human being on the computer. You can send letters back and forth. Even that has its problems in it, as I said. So this is, it's, it, this is, a, this is deep. This is really bad. It's worse than drugs, okay? It, the drugs may have gotten us there. Because what's behind this? The idea ultimately is you can't know the truth. The truth is inaccessible. You can have a formal system, and you can have statistical laws, and you can apply them, but you never get to reality. It's inaccessible to the human mind. And that's essentially, it's the same thing in the economy. It's coherent throughout the entire thing. What's the point of the economy? Human beings shouldn't intervene. They can only screw things up. You have to let the system work its way out. Just act on your pleasures, do what you want, and let the system take its course. Isn't this the argument against federal intervention? Government always screws things. What's government? It's people. <laughs> it's human beings expressing through some form of government the kinds of changes they think might be necessary. 
So this is what you get. Now, you know, and, and, and I think if you take it a few steps further, you get to an interesting point. And I, I may, uh, you know, it, it, now, in a sense, there was a standard that these guys were supposed to come up to. <clears throat> and the idea was, can I model all of mathematics in this kind of a system? Can I arithmetize mathematics? Now, the importance of arithmetizing it is integers. Because the argument that they wanted to make was, really, all of mathematics can be reduced to arithmetic, to the formal rules of arithmetic. And so you had people like uh, this guy who said piano and uh, Frege and so forth who came up with things. And it, it's, it's simple-minded stuff. To give you a, a, an idea, and I might have this slightly wrong because I don't remember it all, but if you look at somebody like Piano or Frege, they basically say, okay, here's the axioms. Um, you have zero, um, and you have the idea of a successor. And what's the other thing? I know I forget this. I don't know, something like, um, I'm probably not going to find this. If I can't find it, it's not. Zero is a number. Okay, zero is a number that you have to have kind of axiomatically. The successor of a number is a number. And um, no two numbers have the same successor. Hmm? Oh, okay. Zero is not the successor of any number. Okay. And you know, this ends up leading to mathematical induction. Some of you may have heard of this. It's based on a simple idea. Once you define the system this way, I'm being a little sloppy, but you get the, you get the basic idea. Well, how do you prove almost anything in, in, in basic arithmetic? If I can prove, take any number. I know this is where people get lost right away, but th th this is a little bit of the subjunct subjunctive. Take any number. Or as they say, let x be any number. And this is sort of the form of, your, of a basic proof. If I can prove that if x has the property b, then its successor, x plus 1, has the property b, then all numbers have the property b. Before x, the first one. Mm -hmm. the first number. Right. Well, if I, this is a, if I let x be any number, well, then it can be any number. It can be any number. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Any number you choose. So it's arbitrary. That's what throws everybody off. The arbitrariness is the essence of the proof. Mm -hmm. If x, if I'm not making any statement about anything peculiar about the number. I can say, take any number. Now, I can prove to you if that number has the property, I don't know, B, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, let's say, if I prove, for example, that every, if I can prove that every X has the property of being even, if X is even, then X plus 1 is even. Of course, that's not true. But if I could prove it, then I would have proven every number was even. Because... Every number has a successor. Every number is the, su is the successor of another number except for zero. Mm -hmm. So mathematical induction is simply the idea that since I've defined the number sequence to be a successor sequence, mm -hmm. if I prove a property of successors, mm -hmm. then I've proved it for all numbers. And I tell you, that's the basic medium of proof in, in, in arithmetic. Okay? Now... And, you know, then you get all, you get, a, so, you know, uh, Russell develops this rather 
you know, sophisticated. I wouldn't say it's, you know, uh, formal logical system. So that you can express all the properties of arithmetic. That's really what the complication is. How do you express all these different kinds of properties? Because you do want to express things that are, are only true of certain numbers. So you have to set up your sentence structure, so to speak, in such a way that you're proving numbers that have the character in these sentences have these properties, and so on and so forth. So he wants to prove that you can do all of mathematics, all of arithmetic, minimally. And ultimately, they want to prove that all of arithmetic is reducible to integers, because think about it. What are they saying? There is no physically continuous process in the universe. All there are are the objects, the countable objects. And that's it. The, the space is an empty box. And physical space is essentially an empty, endless box that has no particular physical characteristic to it. All there is is the objects in it, and the objects don't have any effect on the space. Okay? Or the universe that they're in. Now, what is interesting is that in, you know, and this is the basis for almost everything that's going on right now, so you have to ask yourself an interesting question. Why is that true? Then I'll read you a couple funny things. One, um, why is that true? You know, if you look at game theory, if you look at, uh, m you know, most of what we call modern financial theory, the computer games that are played on it, they're all done on these kinds of, they're all digital systems, all of them. So, did Russell succeed? Did he arithmetic? Did he formalize all of arithmetic? Is this the basis for mathematics? And of course, this would be the jumping off point. The idea was, this was, the program was, we can formalize all of mathematics. The idea was to go beyond arithmetic. Real numbers, geometry, you name it. Well, what happened, of course, is in 1930-31, uh, Gödel proves his uh, undecidability or incompleteness theorem. And it is based on, the core of the system is interesting. It, it, the idea is he creates a certain amount of self-reference out of the formal system itself. He makes the formal system construct sentences that can be used to express things about the system. Now, this gets to be complicated but because it's metamathematical. But in other words, you, he constructs arithmetic sentences that refer to relations amongst the um, numbers, which he then relates to a a, a sentences outside of the uh, arithmetic system in a unique way, in a way that's one-to-one, uh, -one, that, you know, it's not, it's not, there's no ambiguity, okay? Now, what does he base this on? He bases it on the prime number aspect of arithmetic, of numbers. And because the prime numbers are unique and indivisible, he can set up arith arithmetic relations amongst the prime numbers, and those prime numbers have, have arithmetic relations between them and they refer to sentences in the formal system. Every sentence in the formal system has a prime number associated with it. And every prime number is unique to that symbol or that sentence. So he can point to sentences which have a unique prime number. And he can point to arithmetic relations amongst those prime numbers. So they're unique statements about the mathematical system. Okay. Now what's interesting to me is, is, is that, number one, there are all kinds of interesting oddities about prime numbers. Things that you can't prove about them, things that are, you would think are simple but are not simple. And furthermore, it requires the ability of the human mind. It, effectively, this is the human mind creating something out of arithmetic that's not in arithmetic itself. But he's creating an arithmetic relationship based on the prime numbers that allows him to talk about arithmetic in the language of arithmetic. Now, this is, don't, it isn't the mathematical system that's doing this. It isn't the formal system that's doing this. 
It's Gödel that's doing it. Now, by doing this, he creates relations amongst the prime numbers that state things about the arithmetic system that demonstrate that there are truths that the system can't prove. And of course, it's the typical thing at one level. It's this sentence can't prove itself, or this sentence is unprovable in the system. Now, here's the problem. If it's provable in the system, then there's an inconsistency. Because the sentence says, in arithmetic terms, I'm not provable in the system. This sentence is not provable within this arithmetic system. So if you can prove it, then you've proven something that says it's not provable. <laughs> Therefore, the sentence is false, but you've just proven it true. <laughs> However, it is true in the following sense. If you can't prove it, then it's true. <laughs> so either the system is inconsistent or the system is incomplete. Okay? Now, in a sense, if you want to rule it out, then it's incomplete. And there's an interesting twist to this, which goes to something else, which is some clever guy might say, well, look, let me take this particular arithmetic relationship and make it an axiom of the system. Then it's provable as an axiom. Gödel proves that every time you do that, you generate a new, a new unprovable sentence. <laughs> Okay? <laughs> now, uh, uh, this drives the formalists crazy because they oh, yeah, yeah, but that doesn't prove anything and blah, 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 blah. And the essence of it is the sentence that you can't prove doesn't prove all that much. The essence of it is girls' construction of a system that, in a sense, throws a wrench into the formal system. He demonstrates that if you take the system as a totality, which only the human mind can do. A computer can't. All a computer can do is keep churning out the sentences. And this leads to something interesting that Wiener comes up with. Right? So what, is, what really, at this point, does the... Why do we have artificial intelligence now? This is 60, 77 years ago or something. Why is it even a debate? Don't you think the argument should be over? Well, what really did people like Wiener, Russell, von Neumann, what do they really say? They say, well, what you're doing may be true at one level, but we are fundamentally limited in discovering truths to formal systems. We are digital. That's what Wiener says. We're just neurons going on and off. So it may be the case that you've proven something funny about this, but nonetheless, the, if there is such a thing as the kind of creativity you're talking about, it's completely arbitrary, it's completely bizarre, and it's unpredictable. And in fact, most of them just rule it out and just say, well, yeah, you have a few weird sentences that have this odd character, but it doesn't prove anything. All the human mind can do is what, it did, was what a formal system can do. In effect, they define the human mind to be a mechanical system. It's an assumption. And since we're, uh, uh, at least in terms of anything, any useful knowledge, any idea of truth, this is what we're limited to. They simply rule it out. I'll give you some, now, the, and, and of course, what do, they, what do the logical positives say, which I haven't gotten going into? Their basic argument is anything which you can't either point to as a sensory effect or deduce from sensory effects by logical systems is nonsense. <laughs> is metaphysics. And what is, what, what's metaphysical? The human soul is metaphysical. Total, the universe as a whole is a metaphysical idea because you can't experience it and you can't deduce it logically. Of course, God is another re, you know, uh, reason. Because reason is formal logical systems. So in effect, they've created a universe which rules out creative activity in any, in any substantial, any real sense. It's gone. 
Now, lest you think I'm exaggerating this, actually, there's more in this. This is an article on robots and how there's we have to develop social relations with robots because there's going to be more and more robots. <laughs> and even though robots don't really, they don't even claim robots are human exactly. They just say you you really, you know, you have to deal with them because they're in, they're part of things and so on and so forth. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, let me see. That's right. Okay. Here's one guy. I want to understand what it is that makes living things living, Rodney Brooks told me. At their core, robots are not so very different from living human beings. It's all me mechanistic, Brooks said. Humans are made up of biomolecules that, they, that interact according to laws of physics and chemistry. We like to think we're in control, but we are not. We are all human and humanoid alike, whether made of flesh or of metal, basically just sociable machines. <laughs> okay, you like that? Another guy, oh, he says this, we're all machines. Robots are made of different sorts of components than we are. We're made of biomaterials. They're silicon and steel. But e in principle, even human emotions are mechanistic. Then he goes, then the author goes, a robot's level of feeling like sadness could be set as a number in a computer code. <laughs> but isn't a human's level of sadness, but isn't a human level of sadness basically a number two? Just a number of the amounts of various neurochemicals circulating in the brain? Why should a robot's numbers be any less authentic than a human? If the mechanistic explanation is right, then one can, in principle, make a machine which is living. And so on. This is all over there. You go on. Well, oh, here's another one. But maybe higher order consciousness is not even the point for a robot, according to Sidney Perkowitz, a physicist. For many applications, digital people, uh, he, he wrote in a book called Digital People, from bionic humans to androids. Quote, it is, it is enough, it is enough that being seem, that it's enough that the being seems alive or seems human and irrelevant whether it feels so too. And on and on. These guys really do believe this stuff. Where is this thing? It's a New York Times magazine article of a while back. We are mechanical. Therefore, the computer replicates what we do. It's not see, it's not the other way around. You think that these guys have to prove that they that computers are intelligent. They don't think that. No. They think you have to prove that human beings can do anything more than a, than a computer can. Hmm. And almost by assumption, they say that it can. That's why they're so anxious in, you know, digitalizing everything, formalizing everything, and so on. I give you another sense of this, <clears throat> on this question of, you get the same thing in evolution. This is a, a, an article also on where does the idea of God come from? And he, the guy says, well, look, let's, let's forget all the theological crap. Why would people think this? Is it evolutionarily positive? Does it give us any benefit? <laughs> that what's the advantage in believing in a supreme being? But it, it's, what's the advantage in believing in the coherence of the universe? Of the lawfulness of the universe? Now, I'll give you a conclusion. Now. No matter how much science can explain it, and no matter how much science can explain, it seems our big brain. No matter how much science can uh, can explain, it seems the real gap that God fills is an emptiness that our big brain mental architecture interprets as a yearning for the supernatural. The drive to satisfy that yearning, according to both adaptationists, and we think it's uh, uh, you know it's helpful to believe in, and byproduct theorists, might be an inevitable an inevitable eternal part of what Atran, the biologist, calls the tragedy of human cognition. The tragedy of human cognition. That we <laughs> believe that we're creative, we sometimes think a little creatively, and that makes us believe in all these weird things. I'll give you an example of how they think it works. I don't want to... The, the, adapt one, the adaptation is say, well, there's some... Virtue, there must be some virtue in believing in 
God and reason. And the byproduct people say, not really, it just may be an accidental byproduct. <laughs> he describes it like if you build a um, if you build a staircase, you end up with a triangle. Now the triangle is a byproduct of building the staircase. It just ends up being there. <laughs> but the one I like is this one. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Okay, and he calls this a byproduct. It's called something weird. They call it hardships of early human life favored the evolution of certain cognitive tools. Among them, the ability to infer the presence of organisms that might do harm, to come up with causal narratives for natural events, and to recognize that other people have minds of their own with their own beliefs, desires, and intentions. Psychologists call these tools, respectively, agent detection, as you think something is out there trying to do something, causal reasoning, you think there's a reason for why things happen, and theory of mind, you think other people have mind. <laughs> agent detection, because <laughs> you can't know it. Agent detection evolved because assuming the presence of an agent which is jargon for any creature with volitional independent behavior, is more adaptive than assuming its absence. If you are a caveman on the savanna, I don't know how a caveman could be on the savanna, but anyway. <laughs> if you are a caveman on the savanna, you are better off presuming that the motion you detect out of the corner of your eye is an agent and something to run from, from even if you are wrong. If it turns out to have been just the rustling of leaves, you're still alive. What you take to be leaves rustling, if what you take to be leaves rustling was really a hyena about to pounce, you're dead. So you have an advantage in thinking there might be something there. This is agent detection. A second mental module that primes us for religion is causal reasoning. The human brain has evolved the capacity to impose a narrative, complete with chronology and cause and effect logics on whatever it encounters, no matter how apparently random. We automatically and often unconsciously look for an explanation of why things happen to us. And just stuff happens, stuff just happens, there's no explanation, and so on. So he goes on to say basically, this somehow helps us think because we think in terms of causality. But it's no connection to reality. Mm. Now, of course, how did the human species progress beyond being a somewhat clever ape is unexplainable. How come the causal reasoning actually discovered principles that allows us to go to the moon? Unexplainable. But it, it doesn't phase it. They said, well, in fact, I could explain how we got to the moon using this adaptive procedure. So you gotta understand, this stuff is pervasive. It's the financial system, it's the view of government and nation states, it's globalization, it's artificial intelligence. It's at the core of global warming. Ecology. Environmentalism. That's what you're dealing with. It's the reduction of the human mind to zero. To something that's the simplest form of a formal <laughs> system. In fact, I'll tell you something. You can take every one of these computers in principle and reduce it to what they call a Turing machine or a, a, an infinite Turing machine. This guy is considered the genius of the 20th century. He did, you know, who knows what happened to him. He ended up, I think the British did force him to commit suicide. But uh, to make it its simplest, a Turing machine is an optical scanner and a sheet. A sheet? Sheet. It's an optical scanner and a sheet of paper. <laughs> And the operative, the operative notation is it's either blank, each square is either blank, or it has what they call a stroke in it. So you can take any computer and reduce it to some finite number of optical scanners and sheets running through it. And you can, all the, you can do is you can read 0, 1, you can erase the 1, or you can print the 1. Okay? And that's how you can do addition, subtraction. The idea is you can do all arithmetic on a Turing machine. And effectively, I don't care all the circuits and everything else, 
the most complicated computer in the world can be reduced to that model. Is that the idea behind the barcode? Well, sure. Something like that. All right? And of course, there is the interesting thing that electronically, we're now able to process enormous amounts of this kind of stuff. We can do a lot of calculations. The calculations aren't bad. But even the calculations are only approximations. They don't give you the actual principle. The only way you set up the calculation is you know the principle already. The same thing in the calculus. The only way you know what it is you're getting the limit of is you know the function, the physical function to begin with. <laughs> or you discover the physical function. So you have, to get, you have to get at how fundamental this is. This is just a way of getting at fundamental epistemological questions. And to the degree people have accepted, and what, to the degree you turn your social life over to an internet virtual space, whether you realize it or not, you've accepted the idea that the mind is a digital computer. Can you say you, you, you think you can have a social relation because that's the most important thing. You have a social relation to other human beings over the internet where all you're really relating to is the internet information about the person. Then you've essentially accepted the idea that human beings can be represented as digital com uh, devices. A personality can be communicated that way. How did these, how did the, uh, the formal systems and these things deal with that question of not an infinity of repetition, but infinity itself? What? Infinity what? Infinity itself. Well, in a certain sense, they don't. Uh, but what, what they do is they they accept it as in, in, in the sense of um, infinite extension. I mean, what, what, what Contour called... <coughs> or a bad infinite. And that's a complicated question to get into because of the contours problem. But I'm just using that expression. I mean, in other words, it's the idea that the infinite is just, a, you, in a sense, you approximate the infinite by generating something that never stops. That's what, the infinite is something that just never stops. So you never get to infinity. But you know that it's going to keep going on. It's like, it's like the number sequence or, you, or a Euclidean line. It never closes on itself because since it's straight, it always goes beyond itself. And while you never know, you can never go where the line goes, you know that in principle, the line never stops. By the same token, the infinite is natural numbers. N every number is finite. There's no number that's infinite. But since you know every number has a successor, you can say it has a certain kind of infinite extent. And that's their view of the infinite. So, for example, even in the question of the limit, the Cauchy limit, that's in a sense how it works. If you substitute the infinite sequence, what you're really doing is you're saying the infinite sequence equals the limit point, even though you know it never does. Well, and no, uh, you, uh -huh. well how do you rationalize that you know that it never does? Because it gets infinitely is. close. It gets so close that you can't tell the difference. But you still recognize that there's that other thing that's... that's yeah, that's it. it. But the, 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 the guy who's defending the Cauchy says, from a mathematical standpoint, it's... You, you know, no matter where you tell me to stop, I don't have to stop. And so since I can always make it closer than anything you, you want, I'm just giving you their argument, okay? I'm not saying... Uh, since you can... No matter where you stop me, I can get closer. So give me any amount. And you say, I, uh, stop, you know, I can say, no, I can go a step further. So since I can do that, I can equate the infinite series with the limit. Actually, you know, Sky has this in, in, in the article he's doing for the pamphlet. I don't know if it's going to be in as an appendix. 
but he does it for some of this algorithm, this analog differential computer business. And he does go through the point that, yes, mathematically, what you're really doing is you're, you're stopping short of the, uh, you know, the, the continuous uh, dividing the line, and you're saying, let's treat this as though it was a finite amount. And let, let's get what the mathematical relationship is, <clears throat> which is what Pascal and Leibniz do. And that's a, a longer thing to get. But what these guys, what Cauchy's basically saying is, you know, once I generate this, I can show you that no matter how small a difference you try to give me, I can get closer. So there's, in a sense, I, I can reduce the error to zero. Or as close to zero as you like to get. Again, that's why people aren't satisfied with the calculus, but that's what their argument is. So would you say the calculus would be accepting those infinities as a part of the... Uh, like well, the calculus as it's taught, not as it was created. That's the same, That's the point. It's like saying, you know, it's the same thing is true of the Kepler question. How did Kepler get the third law? Or the second, well, however it works, the, you know, the cube of square law. I always get it wrong anyway. What is it, the cube of the distance, uh, the cube of the distance to the square of the time or something like that. Anyway, um, that comes directly out of the harmonies. Right, but so, but what is what is what is the guy you were reading him telling me? What does he say? He says no, that was just some weird idea that led him to the third law, but it wasn't really discovered until Newton deduced it. Hmm. Same point. Leibniz did it this way, but that was wacko. And then of course they argue that Newton had it first because nobody ever uses what Newton did. Think about how ironic it is. <laughs> nobody does the calculus the way Newton does, but. They insist that Leibniz ha that Newton has priority. You have to recognize a lot of this is pragmatism. If it works and it's accepted, you go with it. So Newton discovered the third law because he deduced it formally. See, think about how much the issue here is creativity versus formalism versus proof of absolute truth. See, I think this is very important when Lynn talks about forecasting versus predicting. Same difference. If you know, then couldn't you predict the exact time and moment? If you really know it? You're saying you know there's a crash. Okay, when? Why? Well, then you don't know. Because if you knew the absolute mechanics of the crash of the system, you could tell me what they... Now, you could say it's pretty complicated, I need a lot of data, but you could, you could at least tell me, you know, how many months. You could make a prediction. But no, see, truth is not formal. <laughs> And so that's where you have to look at, no, that's, that's wrong. That's completely wrong. In fact, the whole reason that I can forecast the crash is because it's not predictable. <laughs> because I can forecast that these are human processes, human ideas, the development of human powers, the manipulation of uh, the way human beings think of value. And that's the problem that we have. See, it, 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 it's a hard thing to say, but you got to be a little ironic. No, the reason I can't predict it is precisely because of the nature of is, is what's going to bring the system down. If I could predict it, then I could change it in a simple sense. If I could say to you, I know and prove formally to every economist in the country the crash is going to happen, presumably they would do something. <laughs> But no, this is a matter of choices based on what your conception of humanity is. But I can forecast you that if people choose to consider continue to run the system this way, it will destroy human beings. And it will manifest itself in financial disaster, in collapse, living standards, and political changes. See, that's why you also can't leave it out. You can't act as though... The political change comes after the crash. Political changes will occur as the crash unfolds. 
So you make a choice between Roosevelt and Hitler. That's a political choice. But it's a political choice whose consequences and the nature of the choice is determined by the collapse of the system. There's nothing... There's nothing mechanical in, in the universe, period. I mean, this is the whole thing of entropy. Human history is not a closed system. Finite but self-bounded. Anything else? much about like uh, where this revolution in military affairs stuff comes from like who coined it and like just the word itself um yeah I, I, I'm not sure about that I, I think um and it, it, I only looked at parts of these but I've seen references that we made I think the, the, the basic story on this is um uh typified by Huntington mm -hmm. in this book The Soldier and the State but again, you know, this goes back to the Roman Empire. <coughs> it, it just as a point of reference. Although, you know, I don't want to say that there aren't differences now. But, you know, look. It's funny. Look at the actual history of the United States. And these are things that people should look at. But West Point was set up by members of the Society of the Cincinnati. These were revolutionary war figures who were engaged in a kind of consulting advisory role to the Constitutional Convention. Some of them were part of the Constitutional Convention. Some were not. Um, and essentially, out of this comes West Point. Now, what was the idea at West Point? If you, it's very funny. If you look, besides the fact that, yes, it's an engineering school, it, it really was the idea of nation building that in the military core of the country, the leadership of the military core of the country, would have a conception of war winning based on recruiting your adversary to the idea that your system is better for them than theirs. By, by creating the conditions under which you could actually build the infrastructure or at least teach them and so on and so forth, that would mean their economic improvement. That's why these guys were engineers. If you look at the curriculum, let's say, of Ulysses Grant, it's French, it's engineering, it's physics, uh, you know, military history, yeah, but, I mean, you know, there's a, certain, there's a small portion of the curriculum that's military. Okay? The idea is that this is going to be a core of leadership of the military, and of course, these are relevant, you know, logistical matters and so on and so forth. But that's that's the basic idea. And the idea is that 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 the the army itself is drawn from the citizenry. In other words, it's it's precisely the idea that the citizen has a mission. Also, that you, you want an army that doesn't want to go to war. There's an irony in this. Okay. Because if you have a professional army, then your army is created. What's the purpose of a professional army? To fight. You're trained to fight. Your purpose in life, it's in a sense, if you don't have a war to fight, you don't have a purpose in life. So there's nothing wrong with having professionals, because you do, do want people with a certain level of expertise, but your army... The, the, the rank and file soldier should be a citizen soldier who effectively wants to not only get the war over but has some idea that the process of the war is forestalled further wars. Now, so this was this was the idea, that, and, and this was this is Machiavelli's argument. 
Machiavelli's argument is that the superiority of the, the nation state and the, with the modern renaissance culture and so forth is you've created a citizen who has a stake in defending the state because the state is acting for its purpose. Moreover, the state is creating a more intelligent citizenry, educating it, developing it, raising its living standard. So indeed, the citizen has a certain, if you like, loyalty to the benefits of the nation state. And this is exactly what uh, people like Sarpy understood. That in a sense, there was a, a power in the scientific development, not only of the nation, but that this was being embedded in the citizenry, both in terms of their capability and in terms of their willingness to fight for this. They had a stake in, 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 that, in the nation that no serf had in the medieval feudal form. <laughs> and so Machiavelli said, this is a power that you can't avoid. And Sarpi was the one amongst the Venetians recognized this and said, well, we've got to figure out some way. We're going to have a, a, a greater adversary. We've got to, on the one hand, incorporate some of the strengths of the science and undercut the, uh, the development of the citizenry. Keep them from knowing that indeed it is their creative powers that's the core of the wealth and the abilities of, of, the, of the culture. Now, you know, the, the idea of the revolution in military affairs is, it, is at least partly embedded in this idea of a private, professional soldier whose commitment is to nothing but the techniques and the, who's willing to fight a war without knowing the purpose without having any purpose outside of being a professional soldier, carrying out one's capabilities. Now, the second element of the revolution of military affairs that maybe makes it a little bit different and updates it from uh, Huntington is the idea that you're, you're now in a different zone in the information world. That a lot of this is you can replace logistics in depth, military capability, and even soldiers in depth can be replaced with modern information technology. So you can equip the professional soldier with, you know, uh, on, you know, you know, global positioning satellites, infrared night vision, uh, you know, th their idea ultimately is they can sit at a console. I mean, this is why it's a cyborg to a certain extent. They really do believe these kinds of things. Okay, that you can send the soldier out, he's got all the sensing equipment, he's effectively hooked in in terms of his own equipment in terms of the command center to an information field, plus, of course, firepower technology that allows him or her to dominate as an individual soldier in the way in which it, it, no one else could do it. Plus, it's got a blitzkrieg tendency to it. The idea is you go in, you can hit them from the air, you can bomb them into oblivion. And what is it? It's all, um, um, what do they call these things? You know, laser-guided bombs, precision targeting. So it's all the information technology, the electronic technology, that heightens the so-called, uh, not, not really so much the firepower, but the precision of the firepower. You don't even have and this is all, huh? You don't even have to have human interaction in a war. Barely, right. <laughs> less and less. Drone airplanes were bombing from 30,000 feet up and hitting targets. And so you can, in a sense, take the whole citizenry out of it and run it as a professional military that's dedicated to simply doing its, what it's supposed to do. And that then you don't need a population that's intelligent. You don't, you know, to a certain extent, once you go through the 15th and the 16th century, there's a bit of a problem. On the one hand, you don't want your citizenry to get too smart or too well educated or live too well. On the other hand, if you want to have some security that you can raise an army, <coughs> that's going to be the match of your opponent, you've got to have some intelligence in the population, you've got to have some capability of handling modern weapons, which is not, you know, contrary to what you might think, you can't just take a peasant and give him an art piece of artillery. <laughs> he won't know what to do with it. 
and you have to have certain capability, and you can't just say, well, here's the field book, you know, raise it this much, because what happens is there's a problem with the machinery. And you do need people who can fix things. So the idea is to get superiority in precision firepower through information technologies. You make the soldier into a part of that information system, and then you don't need the citizen soldier. Now, in the long run, does that work? No. Partly, you already see the problem. You see the problem in Iraq. You have a problem controlling what they do. And also, you have a problem with the, 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 these guys. To the extent we have it, they come back and, you know, they're, they're severely damaged. Because they don't know why they're there. And it's, it's contrary to cynicism. It's not always true. There's a certain view of the military that it's always based on a certain sense, the willingness of the soldier to act is always based on small team loyalty. Now, you do get this in, in, in these kinds of professional armies. They have no other purpose. So their idea is, I'm loyal to the guys I'm fighting with. They protect me, I protect them. Now, some of this is normal and not bad, really. But if that's the limit of the sense of loyalty, then you get uh, soldiers who will do, on a lot too large a scale, commit atrocities. The other side of it is because they don't have a sense of purpose when they come back, they're severely damaged. I mean, it's, it's not a pleasant experience watching people die, killing people. Your friends are killed. There's a kind of ruthlessness to the situation. Now, if you take two cases where I'm sure there were damaged people, but the damage was less by all the evidence psychologically, you take the Civil War or World War II. It's interesting, a lot of studies of the damage done psychologically, a lot of the studies that were done on psychological control, uh, shock and awe, all this kind of stuff, was done based on World War I. A lot of it started with World War I. Why? Because World War I was a horrible war. All wars are horrible. But this one was one that most of these soldiers didn't know why they were fighting. And increasingly as it went on, after a surge of this kind of national pride that sent them all out, at, you know, to kill each other, as they got into the trench warfare, and they realized that indeed this was the natural outcome of what, what, what was set into motion, that no one was going to win the war. They were severely damaged, and it was horrifying circumstances, way before we think about today. And a lot of these guys came out, a lot of, the, a lot of what they call battle fatigue or... Um, studies in hysterical reactions and so on and so forth uh, even uh, you know schizophrenia a lot of these came out of studying World War one soldiers shell shock came out of studying World War one now you did have problems when you take the Civil War and World War two people thought people knew why they fought the war they had a sense of purpose in it and as horrifying as it might have been and certainly some people were horrified by it anybody would be horrified by it. But they didn't come out as traumatized in the sense they might have been traumatized by what they saw, by what they went through. They may have been permanently affected. But they, they weren't affected in the sense that they didn't have, have, they lost any idea of why they did what they did. And if you read the letters of Civil War soldiers, you know, they had a very, many of them had a very strong sense of what they're doing. Yet a less a different situation in World War II, but they had a sense of why they were fighting. I think I always think one of the great examples of the effect of World War II in a positive sense, as much as you can make something positive out of war, is that a lot of the civil rights movement, in ways that are unappreciated, was based on the reaction of soldiers coming back, many of whom were prejudiced as hell. But their reaction that having fought with African American soldiers, having fought fascism, they couldn't rightly come back and accept 
discrimination. And so you found many of the World War II vets, uh, at least a, a significant enough portion of the World War II vets, despite their own natural inclinations, simply couldn't go along with certain prejudices. And so that became the, the mass base in the population. Because you got to remember, most of the voting population, you know, let's say in the period of the height of the civil rights movement publicly, which was about 54 to 63, or 65, depends on how you take it, it was mostly World War II veterans. That was the voting population. I mean, you certainly had a huge problem in the South, but even in the South, it partly broke because of that. So the big claim of the boomer generation is a somewhat phony claim. The boomer generation wanted to make a civil right out of sex. That, 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 that's not the same thing. <laughs> the boomer generation just picked up on the idea of civil rights. <laughs> they were to have sex, uh, you know, gender, this and that, and, you know, study groups and who knows what. The real core of it, I mean, there were some of the younger people who were serious. But, but if you look at what happened after about 65, 66, 67, the so-called civil rights movement really turned into the counterculture. And the counterculture was my right to have a counterculture. It was insane. And it really is the basis for what we see today because that was such a... Once you took the boomer generation and it became the me generation, I mean, in some sense, you can make the joke, it was the original MySpace generation. They just didn't have a computer. It was just my personal space. Leave me alone. You know, do for me. And so you had the drug-induced culture... And in a sense, what do you get on these computers? You have a drug-induced state on the computer. You don't need the drugs. But the, so the real the real basis for the civil rights movement was the World War II veteran. And again, I, you saw this look. I saw it with. Um, you saw. I mean, it's a story I like to tell, which is just because I like to throw a politically incorrect story in. Is you, you look at the one of the first. Act of the civil rights after World War II was the uh, integration of baseball. Jackie Robinson. Now, the, the guy who integrated it was a guy named Branch Rickey, whose family was an abolitionist family from Missouri. And he had always wanted to do this. But he couldn't do it until after the war. And one of the signature... In, see, a lot of baseball players are from the South. And some of them were vicious racists. There was one guy named Dixie Walker that threatened to, to never go on the field if, you know, if, if Jackie Robinson was on the field and so on and so forth. But one of the signature moments was when uh, the... Uh, um, uh, but a lot of baseball players were World War II vets. So you had two things going on. Okay, And the famous story is Pee Wee Reese, who was the shortstop for the Brooklyn Dodgers at the time, was from Louisville, Kentucky. And, you know, had a nice southern accent and so on and so forth. And at a certain point, he walked up and put his arm around Jackie Robinson. And there's a famous picture of this. Now, there's all kinds of rumors about what really went on. But the fact is, he did it. And this became somewhat of a, of a public image of the acceptance of um, the integration of baseball by southern whites. Uh, I assure you, there was massive prejudice. But all you needed was a few of these guys. It's not, I'm not saying everybody came back good. But all you needed was a few of them to go against the prejudice. And I, I tell you the same, because they, the same thing is true. Like my father was the same way. My father was a prejudiced guy. Uh, to the day he died, he was a prejudiced guy. But I think the experience of part of being an immigrant, he came over in, in 38 from Poland and so on and so forth. And uh, he went. In, he was. Uh, he was in the army within three years of coming to the United States. And the idea of, that he was going to be, he was going to uh, discriminate against somebody because they were of a different racial or ethnic or whatever, he, that he couldn't stomach. Even though personally, he was as prejudiced as they come. But he would say, no, they ought to have. They ought to be able to go to school. They ought to be able to get in the same restaurant because why do we go to do all this? What was the point of fighting the war if we're, if we're going to be that way? And it was, it was in many ways a tension in them. But it was, it was a tension that went in that direction. And what you got with the boomer generation was turning this all into a, you know, 
a self-help program. <laughs> so, you know, in one sense you have to face it. In one sense, I suppose there, there are no good wars at one level. But there are better wars. If you have to fight, at least fight for a good purpose. And there are good purposes and not good purposes. World War I was a complete disaster. The Vietnam War. It was where you, you can't back up. It may be that boomers did stupid things and they weren't really opponents of the war. For the most part, they just dodged the draft. And they rapidly turned the anti-war movement into a counterculture movement. All that stuff. Most of what you know of as the anti-war movement or the civil rights movement was really to the degree it existed. The civil rights movement goes way back. I mean, Amelia was in it in the 1920s and 30s. Okay? But it began, it had a moment of flourishing after World War II because of this situation. But the, the high point of it was essentially, you know, the, the mid 50s to 63, 64, somewhere in there. <clears throat> and then it, it faded. And of course, you, you could see the issue with King. King really tried to come back in 67, 68 with something that was different than the original civil rights movement in the sense of expanding it. And his idea that, that, that the civil rights movement could turn itself into the vanguard for a fight for economic justice. And that's the point at which he got assassinated. That was a, an effort to take it in a different direction. It never went there. It went into this counterculture, baby boomer, terrified, freaked out, the world has no reason to it, worldview, which was a mess. So this is a problem with Clinton to a certain extent. Clinton is a believer in the 68 er generation. <laughs> and uh, it's wrong. I mean, I saw this stuff. You know, most of the people who claim to have been in the anti-war movement may have been for a short period of time, but by 69, 70, 71, if you ever went to a, an anti-war rally and then to a party afterwards, which, you know, it was, people were popping drugs like you wouldn't believe. It was all, get me out of here. I think the difference now is that, with that it, it, it's totally disassociated because you've gone through 30 or 40 years where this whole idea of the social development of ideas, the creative powers of the human mind, that's all gone. It's just this individual crazy world which is completely disassociated. But it was created by boomers. Look at who created this thing. Bill Gates, Stuart Brand, Wired Magazine. Most of these people are 50 years old or older. They're sort of the gurus of this world. Artificial intelligence, is, this is what these people are. And a lot of it is related to this idea of what we, what we, you know, it, we loosely say immortality. I mean, I, I, as I see the way these things work, you want to define this a little better. Because you do have to realize it's a paradox. You're not immortal. You're mortal. And frankly, this may come as a shock to some of you, but there's no substance, there's no material substance of any kind, or even what we could call a spiritual substance, at least that I believe, that lives after you. What lives after you is what you do now. It, it's ironic. What's immortal about you is what you accomplish in your mortal life. That's worth someone else preserving. It's what you leave behind and what is it that you can leave behind? The only thing you can leave behind is the good that you do. It, 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 it's, it's what you embody as a person that you strive to accomplish and may accomplish for humanity, but even striving to accomplish it. It's that in your personality which you leave for other people which they can act on. which they can make use of in their own betterment. That's your immortality. 
So whatever you, you're going to do to be immortal, it's going to live after you. Whatever your soul is, you have to do it now while you're alive. I think sometimes people got a little bit into into some other idea about this. Yes, it's all what you do with your mind. We're human beings. The essence of what we do, think of the difference. There is an interesting difference. Because there's a good that people do of a certain kind. And in many ways, it's, it's easier to be secure about this. <clears throat> you know, you produce children. And you do everything you can to make life better for your children. And you hope that the child that you produce does something good for humanity. And in a sense, there's a kind of immortality you get if you succeed in doing that. It's a, I wouldn't call it immortality, but you at least get to succeed into a coming generation or two. Now, the problem is that's limited for human beings, and human beings don't reproduce themselves biologically. Human beings reproduce themselves by reproducing the society that produced them. And reproducing it with improvements necessary to deal with the problems that that society is going to face. 25, 50, 100 years from now. Apparently when Lin addressed the Chinese today, he made the point, we have to think in terms of 50 to 100 years. Two, three, four generations. So what you, you, what, you, there's a different way in which human beings reproduce, which is creating the basis for the creative ideas that are needed to solve the problems that society faces in such a way that society as a whole can act on those ideas. Which means creating the conditions in which people, human beings are able to address those kinds of problems. They're free enough. They're free from material circumstances. Enough that they can address the fundamental questions they guarantee progress into the future. So while it's good to raise a good family, it's a limited sense of goodness. And human beings, whether or not they have a family, have to think beyond simply the goodness of the family and the children and so on and so forth. You have to be creating the circumstances under which other human beings in that society will be, will be able to get the same benefits. There's a larger sense of universal goodness that's required for human beings. And so it's not just numbers, it's the development of the population. I saw a funny, to get a difference, I don't know if people always get it, I saw a funny, uh, if you want to contrast to a kind of biological view, and, and in a sense, while human beings, when you're dealing with human children, okay, you're dealing with human potential. But uh, if you reduce it the wrong way, there was a funny story I saw. You know, they reintroduced um, wolves into Yellowstone over about the last, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years. <laughs> so they have all these packs of wolves. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, one group of wolves, according to the story, one group of wolves dominated this valley, which was kind of the best place to have, because, you know, there were deer and plentiful food and most of the year and so on and so forth. And they were the dominant pack, whatever they were called, anyway. So all of a sudden, the, the leading male and the leading female, they're getting old, they're getting worn down, they have about 12 or 15 members of the wolf pack. And, um, you know, a lot of this is just, anyway, so... So, the, so they, they're, they're losing. They're not reproducing as many pups and uh, so on and so forth. So another pack comes in. And, of course, it's totally ugly if you ever see these things. Compl nature in the raw is about as, of this type, particularly amongst predators, is about as ugly as you can get. So this other pack of wolves gets comes in, and they sense the weakness, and they wipe this pack out except for, you know, you know the old ones die off, and there's about four left two males, two females, and no pups. So they're pushed off into the far access is the worst place for wolves, and this other pack takes over. So over about two or three years, what happens is the pack that took over, they get some distemper virus, 
kills off one generation of pups. Then another problem comes up. So after about two or three years, they've only reproduced a couple of pups. And so their wolf pack has shrunk from about 15 to, you know, eight or nine. And they're kind of not in good shape. So another wolf pack comes in and finishes and kills off their last pups. And then finally they get so demoralized that they refuse to even de defend their pups. And so they, all the pups get eaten up in about the third year. And this one pack disappears. But meanwhile, the first pack <laughs> has been off in this far corner of the uh, valley. And for about three years, they've been producing pups. And they've managed to produce about three crops of pups. And now they've gone from four to about 15. <laughs> and what do they discover? <laughs> they can take the valley back. <laughs> because they produce three generations of wolf pups. <laughs> so that's, that, that gives you an idea of uh, population, growth in population and the <laughs> retake, retake territory. But that's not the way you were leading to it. Okay? <laughs> That's sort of a feudal approach. <laughs> Go out and recruit an army, pay the, pay the mercenaries, come back and retake your territory. In this case... Yeah? From the, uh, the Bye Bye Pelosi paper, was this compromise of 1877 just... I was pulling out a reconstruction too early, or, or what, what else was it? Well, I mean, he, I think he's specifically referring to the Tilton Hayes Compromise. Okay, that's the specifics of it. And it is that. I mean, it is... Um, um, when, when Hayes came in, it was recognized that that was the end of reconstruction. Now, it wasn't so much that Tilton was all that much better, but some of the, some of the people around Tilden might have fought more for the, for the Reconstruction. Now also, of course, there was more going into this. The, 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 yeah, these are all things... For example, you, you had two things going on at the same time. You had the 1876 Exposition, which really was... See, that's not just a model. That was, the, that was a huge effect globally. These expositions were very important. All the leaders you know, would come in and look at the technologies, the machinery, what do we have? And they realized the United States had succeeded in doing something that was unique, that, it was, that now had a unique capability to develop economically and so forth. Now, the other side of it is, of course, there had been a deployment against this. Uh, well, because, but, it, but in particular, you had the attack on the U.S. economy, financial system, in the late 1860s and early 1870s that led to the, to the crash of 1873 the Species Resumption Act. And this is where Grant had some problems. I'm not quite sure. Grant, the, I, I can't, Grant does not seem to understand some of this stuff. He's a decent guy. He wasn't that horrible a president. But he had tremendous Wall Street scandals going on around him that touched into his family. I think it was his son-in-law or whatever. Okay? So, these kinds of, that you did have a major financial destabilization which was already undermining the U.S., for example, development of the U.S. Uh, rail system. I mean, we never finished the actual plan on the rail system. Okay? I mean, the idea was to have four or five main transcontinental lines. Or we at least didn't finish them at that time. Two. Huh? Two now, don't we? Two, yeah, yeah, right. And a couple have been shut. I mean, there may have been... But the idea was to have four or five of them right then and there. The idea was the whole development of the American West, which never occurred. So a lot of it was that question. And then when, when you had the, 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 the electoral compromise in 76, 77, and the pull out of the federal troops, that was recognized as the end of any effort to develop the South. Which meant you weren't developing the West, and you weren't developing the South. This is when you had all kinds of things going on. This is what Lynn's referring to about the education, when the, it really gets pulled back. 
because you were, there were some efforts to institute the Fisk. Fisk University was created during the Reconstruction. A lot of uh, efforts at educational systems occurred then. All that essentially ended, or most of it. So that, to my knowledge, is what Lynn's referring to. Um, Lynn's been talking recently about to take a piece of, uh, like a specific composition, musical composition, as that composition being, in a sense, a universe in and of itself that's complete. It's completely filled out. There's nothing more and nothing less that you could possibly have. And, um, I mean, kind of thinking about that, you say, okay, if you you're talking about something being a universe. You have a, it has to be finite. Obviously, a classical musical composition is finite, but it's got to be somehow bounded by something from sort of the inside of it. And it seems like a very um, unique and intriguing example of this because it's artistic composition itself seems like the only moment at which you actually have the intersection of the human creative idea bounding something intersecting with also the boundaries of physical principles. Harmony, mm -hmm. the bel canto mm -hmm. singing voice. I just, I mean, that seems like it, I don't know if you can. Well, I think, I think um, one, one thing that I was, we, it is, it, there's two things, but one is, see, think of this question of sight and sound. I mean, what is Lynn talking about? It's not the most obvious thing to me, what he's talking about. I think he's thinking uh, the, the visual field has a character of objects in space and certain kinds of relations amongst them. You might say quantities, objects, it's discrete. Okay, in fact, I think that one of the points that Riemann makes when he talks about discrete versus continuous manifolds is the visual field is actually a discrete manifold. Okay, now, sound is a continuous manifold. It, 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 sound is a manifold that's characterized by cycles, by wave, by wave phenomena that are, in other words, you have a division of the string, but what's the division of the string? The division of the string, or the division of the circle, is a differential cycle, a periodicity. Well, it, I thought... Didn't he say that position is mm -hmm. position is discrete, but something visual like color? Color is not right. I mean, I, I'm talking about objects in space. You know, color as a manifold is continuous. Right. Right. But the op position of objects in space is discrete. Now, in a sense, what you, what what happens is that since the physical universe is one universe, you know that even though you may have a relatively discrete image from the visual field, or measures of relations amongst objects, that you have to incorporate into that universe the harmonics of a continuous field that's dividing itself by its action, which is what a wave is of some kind. It's a cycle. So you, as you change the cycles, you're changing the division of the space in which you're operating in. So I, for those reasons, and of course, Sound has another character, which is sound is the way in which human beings communicate ideas. Okay, so there ha there's there's a there's a some internal harmon uh, har says that I won't use that word of some set of internal relations that allow you to use the sound generated by the human organism, physical organism, to co to communicate ideas. Now, it does come from a physical organism, so it's an organism that exists as an object in space. It's a discrete organism. So you have the discrete and the continuous. You have, uh, you know, the sound of language produced by a physical body. Now, I think that what, when, when you do something, now, I think it is true. The reason Lynn is saying that any artistic product, particularly music, is a complete universe. It's finite. In other words, no idea is 
it was this point we were making before. An idea cannot have has to have closure. It has to have a certain completeness to it. It can't if, if it's open ended. It's not an idea. In other words, you are asserting something about the world, about the way in which the world, as you know it, is organized. So you're using the physical organism, a biological organism, which somehow is the seat of a cognitive being. It's the seat of a mind, which cannot be reduced to the biological organism. But it does exist in this discrete phenomenon. So, now, by taking a number of human beings, I mean, I think, you, you know, whether it's a chorus or um, a quartet or something like that, a string, a string quartet, you're now using the physical organism and all of the range that it gives you, all the color. And think of it, you know, in a way to get out of, think, it's not, think of intonation, think of when you speak. Now, you may do it poorly. But if you're if you're not in some kind of crazy state of mind, you are try you may do things wrong. You may be too intense. I mean, you can, you can apply all the things in a funny way that you can apply to music. You can apply to somebody talking. They can be awkward. Their their color can be off. Their pitch can be off. Their intonation can be off. The lack of pauses. They can talk too fast or too slow. But they can also do all those things to get your attention and to communicate the idea. <laughs> okay? So now, uh, what you have in the music, in a, let's say in a choral setting, which I think why you want to start with that or you know some group, not the solo business, okay, is so that you can... Because this is, in a sense, the fourth domain. It is a social process where you are using the range of physical capability and what you can do to the space around you. You know, you, there are things you do with the human voice that changes, that organizes this, the at least the physical space around you. And you're using that to, communi uh, to communicate ideas. So you're, you, th then you're using that in relationship to other voices. So now all these voices have to coordinate their use of the physical organism, the voice, to create this idea. And of course then there's the relationship to the audience and the relationship to the composer. But these are all relationships of human minds. It's all part of a social setting. And all ideas are deliberated on, communicated socially even though the idea comes from the mind of a single composer. And that is also part of the relationship, right? Because you want to be able to replicate the discovery of the, comp the idea of the composer in the way in which you perform the piece. And that is to transmit that to the audience. So it's all social. It can be generational. And of course, I think then the other side of this is that in the course of doing all that, you do, even though this is a finite, complete idea, in a sense it is, but it isn't. Because somewhere in this is also the potential to go further. To, in dialogue with that idea, create a new idea. Or develop off of it. I mean, and these are the things I think people will look at. Because, you know, certainly um, in some of the recent dinner discussions, even, I think, that I got third or fourth hand. Um, um, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn refers to Lynn refers to the late Cortex, which he, he did years ago. You'd be surprised how many of these things are just coming up again, and and maybe in more developed forms. But they're reference points. You know, it's like people were shocked when they would read Lynn from the 1970s and find out that he mentioned Gauss. And it's, oh my God, it, was, it wasn't something that just came up six years ago. <laughs> In fact, the truth is his complaint against the boomers, in part, forget everything else he complains about the boomers, is, uh, is, uh, is that they didn't pick it up. Or they didn't pick it up from his standpoint. This is his complaint about the calculus. Yes, he said do something on the calculus, but they did it from the standpoint of Cauchy. Yes, he mentioned Gauss, but it really, what, to my knowledge, wasn't picked up all that much. I mean, maybe somebody did. I don't, I don't remember it. Um, 
people didn't pick up on these things. He mentioned it. He also referred, I mean, now I, I remember some stuff that at least one, I, 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 know what, I don't know what Bruce did back then, but Fred Haight did work on the late quartets, I don't know, in the late 1970s. At least I remember going to a class that he gave. But in general, it wasn't picked up. Now, the late quartets do represent something new. Not that it's not related to what Bach did and what Mozart did, but I think the late quartets represent, in a sense, opening up a new musical space. There's something, there's some new levels of freedom in the late quartets that don't exist before then, even though it's continuous with what went before. And in some ways, I suppose you could say they sound more like Bach <laughs> than a lot of the other stuff. But it's from a different standpoint. It's a different musical domain. It's not, he's, he's moving in somehow in different ways that at least I can hear. I can't necessarily explain, you know. But you can, you, when you listen to it, you know you're listening to something different. That's in that tradition, but it's something different. So that, that's how I would, I mean, I really think this idea of a, a, that this is the fourth domain. Not just to give it that name, but it, to, to spell it out in a sense, you're taking the idea of the composer, but now you, you, you're using the human physical organism, which is uniquely, I'll use the word evolved, developed. In a sense, everything about the human physical organism is meant to communicate ideas. So is it specifically the, the performance that you're talking about? Well, not, not just the performance, everything that goes into the performance. But you might take the performance as all of the rehearsals mm -hmm. and discussions and everything that go into what happens when you perform. Yeah. That's 2,000 years of history. Yeah, but it, you, can, you can limit it to the choral work. Hopefully you don't have 2,000 years of rehearsal. <laughs> So, you know, it, 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 that's, it, the, the human voice, I mean, I wasn't kidding, though I don't think, you know, the, animals can't create the same range of sounds that we do. And no primate comes close. I mean, there, there are actual physical elements, so I don't want to limit it to that. For example, the palate of a chimpanzee is flat. The pharynx is, is, is it doesn't exist in the same way. So there's a whole, there's a whole limit to the resonance of the, uh, the head chambers of a chimpanzee. They don't have the same sinus cavities. They, they, they don't have the same flexibility in the tongue or the lips. I mean, a, a huge amount of the central nervous system, or a, a huge amount of the nerve endings of a human being are in the head and the lips. So, to a certain extent, there's a lot in the fingers and the hands, but there's an enormous amount that's just up in the area where you're producing most of the sound, or most of the differentiation in the sound. So you have to look at the, this is why it's the human voice. You have to look at the human voice as the one instrument in the universe, other than the universe itself, that's there to create, to, to communicate ideas. To generate creativity, to provoke new ideas. And so the way it gets provoked is you do create a universe. You create principles that bound themselves, that seem to be complete, that are one idea. And yet within that, if you do it right, if you, it, it, as, as you try to communicate this to other human beings, you're also going to get a sense of the kinds of ironies that lead you to expand that universe. So it's not as though the universe isn't complete in itself, it also generates certain kinds of ironies and paradoxes that lead you to generate a new way of dealing, of using this universe. Because it's all in one universe, really. We're sort of developing our idea of this universe. Have to believe here. Twelve. The last minute is twelve. <laughs> 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 I, I just know there's something with the tea. You know, that, you know. Oh, 
Now they have this new line. You know, isn't this new since? Yeah, I was here in February or March, and I never saw the silver line before. Oh, it's just a yeah. bus. It's yeah, a bus. Yeah, it's an underground bus. An underground bus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they call it the silver something or other. Silver, it's the silver line. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Well, we can break up and people like smaller discussion until we. Everybody has to go. Unless somebody else has a question. What's happening? Yeah, yeah, Jenny. So I was just going to ask about, um, like, the, the singing list, like, um, some of the questions that are coming up around the right technique of singing and all this stuff, yeah. and how you actually judge. This has been a kind of real paradox for me, how you judge. Because um, you have all these different people, if you read accounts of singers, everybody has an yeah. idea of how you sing. And they all disagree. I mean, certain sense. I know. So it's just, it's just <laughs> how you actually um, And it seems to me like the, the judge for it is how you most efficiently communicate an yeah. idea in the most profound way. But it just seems like, yeah, I don't know if that's like a solid proof of whether a technique is valid or not, a vocal technique? Well, I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, this is something you might want to, I'm sure you've raised it with Lynn, I, I'm not expert enough, but I suppose you can look at certain kinds of things. Um, yes, look, I think it, it, you do ultimately want to subordinate all of it to how does it work in a chorus. I mean, you do, you do have to use these voices together. I mean, yes, you can have a solo. But in a certain sense, when somebody does a solo, what should resonate in your head is everything that's not in the solo. And they, 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 their reference point is they're part of something bigger than the solo. Certainly, certainly any major thing. In other words, if it's part of a mass or it's part of an opera. I mean, you know, one of the most distracting things about going to operas, I'll just say this as a sideline, <laughs> is you know, these beautiful voices, and they're out there singing and so forth, and, they, and, and then the audience applauses every, and every aria. aria. And you lose somehow the point of the, of the opera. <laughs> but you think of the opera as a series of solo performances. Yeah. Yeah. It becomes something like an athletic event. You know? yeah. um, how high can you go? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, there, you, I just think it would be you, there's there's you have to think I think of the the ensemble uh, it, because it, it, so you you do need to make the voices work together. Now the problem that you get with a lot of choral work is the, the simple solution by the average choral director is to smooth everything out. Mm -hmm. Vibrato, voice, everything. You know, uh, so that it all kind of goes together. Okay. So I think you do you you do want to recognize that in the end, however, you do have to make these voices work together. So, uh, you know, at least my tendency in this is that that is ultimately the measure of, you know, for example, if somebody doesn't have enough control over their voice to properly modulate it so that at the right moment they can be at the right volume, then you have a problem, even though the, the voice may be magnificent heard by itself. Things like that. Now, how to do the voice technique itself, I mean, you know, I, I know that there's all these, uh, you know, issues, and I, I've never been uh, a vocal trainer or never really had you know much of a vocal voice myself but so um, the one thing I would say is you want to go for in a sense start with the idea that within limits you, you, you know the idea is that the, the, the human organism is constructed to produce the right kind of sound so if you get the human individual in the right state of mind any human being, short of somebody who's got physical damage, should be able to produce the right kind of sound. That they may not be as big a voice. There may be those kinds of differences. I'm not saying there aren't. But every human being ought to be able to produce 
a proper range of singing and a proper control of the voice, a proper quality, whether it's vibrato and even the strength of the voice. It's like this one wonderful thing I learned at a certain point. Very few people are tone deaf. Even though a lot of people, when you try to start to train them to sing, will tell you, I'm tone deaf. That's why I can't hit the note. Mm -hmm. And almost nobody is tone deaf. Mm -hmm. You almost can't be human unless, <laughs> unless you have some kind of damage. You know, if you have hearing damage or something like that. You know, but if you're just a person who's you know who's never had much experience with music and is somewhat frightened of it, nonetheless, every human being can sing in tune. Maybe they, we don't have perfect pitch. I don't know about that. Okay, but certainly in the right setting with accompaniment and so forth, every human being can hit the right note. Fundamentally, every human being can sing in the bel canto method. So all that, that's the only starting point I would have for it. I, I, you know, like this question of support versus, you know, what vowel you sing. And cut. I'll never forget the experience I had years ago when, when Brianna was around. And, um, you know, he's changed over the years. I don't really, but we had people then, this is back in the 80s. And they were, you know, listening to Brianna. And sort of at that time, my basic approach to, was just do what Brianna tells you to do. We had no, that, that was all we had. <laughs> so, um, um, and uh, uh, we had a bunch of people in the organization who were going to see voice teachers, and most of it was, you could tell, it was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And they would bring these techniques in, mm -hmm. and they just got weirder and weirder. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you had to sort of stand a certain way, and, you know, uh, put certain things in your nose. And <laughs> Weird, all right. But, the, uh, but then you would, get, you would get the phenomenon like well, one of the people I knew in New Jersey, and, and he was a good guy. Actually, had a good voice, a lot of musical training. So he starts out, and he's like, he's doing what Briano said, and then he starts reading these books. And uh, I guess I think he also saw, saw some videotapes. And bit by bit, almost without even knowing it, he changed everything he was doing. He reinterpreted everything. Okay, and he ended up doing almost the opposite. And he thought he was doing the right thing. So, you know, it, uh, finally I sat down, I said, look, I don't know that much, but man, this is not exactly the way we started out. <laughs> so that was a real experience. I, I, I think that's, that you have to sort of, Try to stay with some basics. That's, that, you know, things that, you know, we may not know the whole story. And, you know, you guys talked to Lynn and, you know, so on. But stick to it. Get, get some basics down. And I think one of the basics is people, if they're relaxed, if they, you know, they're not uh, tensed up too much, uh, there's a, every, everybody has the ability to produce a bel canto sound. There's nothing mysterious about it. There's nothing, it's not a unique talent in the sense that only certain people can do it. I think that's sometimes where some of the problem lies. Now, there may be people who are horribly blocked and give you a real hard time. And when it gets to some of the, some of the you know, more refined and nuanced points of how to get the voice out, I, I, I would rather, I, I, I really don't know enough to say about that kind of material. I just think we, you have to be careful. It's useful to be a little bit skeptical, except a few of the things that we know we've worked on. You know, the, the only thing I've heard about, you know, I, I think that you have to recognize that some of the things that you do to get the individual voice going, you also, you can't, you have to, you have to bring it under some control in the chorus. Because there's, 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 if you like, a subtlety of what you're doing in the choral work, in, in the adjustments of the voices and so on and so forth, that does require a certain level of control. And as I think I mentioned, I think one of the tough things for us, if you think about it, the one thing I'll say, I think is true, and this is, is, you know, nobody is doing what we're doing. In other words, to my knowledge, certainly no, no chorus I ever heard sing Bach sings it in uh, bel canto. They, they sing something else. It, usually they're trying to, trying to moderate, the, uh, really reduce the vibrato to nearly nothing, 
Um, I mean, sort of the standard is a, is a certain what they call a white voice. Um, we once uh, in, in L.A. went to hear a group that did Jesu Minor Freud a cappella. And I guess, you, and, and poof, it, they, they really, they destroyed the, cog, the cognitive content. I mean, they had nice voices at a certain level. But it was so, it was so white, that there was almost no differentiation. And um, so, so what we're doing is, is fairly unique. In other words, we're trying to take the full powers of the human voice and bring it into a choral setting. And across the choral setting, not just a Verdi chorus, where you know people t there it's used to a certain extent. But of course, those are different kinds of choruses. They're not really, you're not doing a choral piece that's the whole idea. You're using a chorus as part of, or even the background, in an opera. Unless you took, um, I mean, I suppose Verdi's Requiem would be a counterexample, but that's the only, that's the only counterexample I know of in Verdi, and I, I don't know well enough. The Misa Solemnis is the, yeah. that's the reference point. Yeah. So I think those are some of the things to look at. And I think it is difficult, because there is a lot, and when people get music teachers, oh yeah, forget it. <laughs> they all become advocates for their music teacher, their singing teacher. That's what happened. You had all these people who went to their own singing teachers, and they all became advocates of their own singing teachers. <laughs> so I think, I think you do have to go with some caution on it. I mean, the one thing about Briano is, is that that he has an almost overweening concern. For the, you know, I'm not going to do anything to damage the voice, damage the voice, damage the voice, which is a real concern. It's just sometimes it may be a little bit too constraining. You're not really going to hurt the voice that much. But somebody else has to judge those things. I would never, you know, get too far into that. I don't, you know, uh, I can only tell you some of my observations. Well, I think we're also the only institution that says everybody can sing. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, when you read these accounts, this is something we were discussing, is like all these people are, they're working with a certain controlled group of people, which is kid, people who have already been deemed good singers, mm -hmm. right? Those conservatories, <coughs> choruses. And we're not, we're, we're, at, we're saying anybody can really Absolutely. sing. Absolutely, exactly. And it's a totally different process mm -hmm. from that. No, exactly. I mean, I think that we're operating from the same way that everybody can do this which is a whole different world. You know, there was this point where we were doing, um, I don't remember now, maybe it was even children's choruses, where we were trying to go in and, uh, you know, to a church or whatever and get access to a certain number of these children and try and begin. To, they did this in Mexico up to a certain point. I don't even know what, you know, uh, it, at some level it did work. Uh, what's his name? Alfredo. Alfredo, a little bit, yeah. yeah. I mean, some of that, whatever he ended up doing, some of that wasn't, some of that was was, was useful, at least as far as I understand it. But certainly, it's, that, it is, that's, I think, we're operating from an epistemological standpoint, from, a, from a, 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 a methodological standpoint, that indeed, what we're talking about is natural to the human voice. In some sense, natural. It's there. It's there as a potential. It's sort of like the way you look at people anyway. You, you, you do always have to operate from the standpoint that, that there is a fundamental goodness in every person. There's also a great voice in every person, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> you have to develop both of those, really. 